Hello, and welcome to DevFest 2020. I'm Jason Titus, VP of Engineering at Google, joining you from my home in California. Each year, we at Google truly feel the anticipation for DevFest. It's a one-of-a-kind series of developer conferences, and we're glad you can join us and the local developers within your community. Your local DevFest event this weekend is one of hundreds taking place all around the world right at this moment. And what makes DevFest truly unique is that it's run by volunteer community organizers on a mission to help other local developers grow and share a passion for Google technologies. Let me introduce you to my teammate, David, to share with you some great examples. Welcome, David. Hi, Jason. Thank you. And welcome, everybody, to this year's DevFest season. I'm David McLaughlin, Director of Developer Ecosystems at Google. So I've been with DevFest since the very first year in 2010, when I was able to join a, a large percentage of them. Back then, they were a series of targeted events in just a handful of countries. In the years since then, we've had massive growth to countries all over the world. I'm happy to be able to continue the celebration of developers and tech in a new virtual format and bring people together to learn and to share what we're all building. Now let's take a look at a really inspiring story from Uganda. It shows how a community member started learning about machine learning and ended up building a really nifty app using TensorFlow that detects diseases in plants and helps farmers reduce crop devastation. Take a look. Growing up in the city, I never expected to work in agriculture, but when fall armyworm attacked, it affected us all. Since its arrival in 2016, this crop pest has caused massive devastation. I've met farmers who have lost everything. So I wanted to use my skills as a software developer to help. At a Google Study Jam, we taught ourselves TensorFlow. We started by building an Android app on top of an open source API. The app allows farmers to spot infestations early, far beyond the capability of human eyes, and suggest an effective treatment. When I was younger, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but then I discovered app development and I was excited to show people something they never thought possible. Machine learning gives us the advantage against fall armyworm, ultimately saving harvests and reducing pesticides. Mm. We are just getting started, and there are so many other sectors like health and education that machine learning could really improve. Farming is a crucial aspect of life in Uganda, and I feel proud. I'm part of a team driving to ensure our culture can continue. Earlier, you saw a beautiful inspirational video about how machine learning and Android we used to create an app to detect crop diseases. So for DevFest, I wanted to get together a few of my friends from Google and beyond to show you how you could get started in building something just like that from scratch in a few minutes. We'll build an Android app and a web app. I want to create an app that's able to recognize information about plants. It's going to need camera functionality as well as machine learning inference. Let's see what that looks like in code. The app is written in Kotlin and uses CameraX to take the pictures, an ML kit for on-device machine learning analysis. The core functionality is in Take Photo, where we take a picture, analyze it, and display the results. First, we call Take Picture on a CameraX image capture object that was created earlier. One of the parameters is a callback object, which has this onCapture success function. We get the received image into the format we need for ML kit, then we create an image labeler object and process the image. When this succeeds, we receive a collection of image labels, which we turn into text strings and display a toast with the results. Let's see what the demo looks like. So we'll take a picture and it says, I see an insect and a plant. So that was pretty easy, rigging up CameraX and ML Kit to detect arbitrary objects in the camera view. But the results were pretty generic because the data set didn't have enough information about our domain. 
So let's dig a little deeper. Okay, let's go deeper. Now we need a model for something very specific, detecting diseases in bean plants instead of cassava. Let's explore how to build it. On this guide, we'll use some of the great TensorFlow tooling available. Let's start with Colab. You can understand Colab as a cloud-hosted development tool. We will do all our coding on it, and you will not need to install anything on your machine. Let's start with a new notebook. Let's just turn the Python to beans. We will need to install some packages that we are going to use later. These packages are not installed on your machine. They are on a cloud machine that was created for your collab. Nice, it finished installed the packages. Let's download the data and do some visualization to understand how our data is separated. Perfect. We download the data. Let's take a look on some of the images so we can have a better understanding of what we are doing here. Here they are. These are some of the images that will be used for training our model later. Now we have the data. We need to create a model. We are not going to create one from scratch. We are going to use a technique called transfer learning. TensorFlow Hub is a repository for TensorFlow models. You can find all kinds of models here. Let's start with this one. Let's go back to our collab. Let's define a model handle. Nice. Now we have the data and the base model. How can we do transfer learning? To do that, we are going to use one of the tooling that I mentioned before called Model Maker. Model Maker make your life way easier when you need to do transfer learning. Let's create the spec for our base model. Let's create our train variables here using the data set beans that we've just seen. And now we are going to put everything together with Model Maker by defining a model with the training data and the spec that we got from TensorFlow Hub. This will take a couple of minutes. It finished training. And as you can see here, our accuracy is at 87%. Of course, let's evaluate the model with some data it didn't see yet and see how good it is. Nice, 95%. The TensorFlow Lite model Gus just created contains all the metadata Android Studio needs to recognize it and automatically build classes for it. To get started, you can update your build.gradle file to include the following TensorFlow Lite dependencies. Then, you'll want to import your generated TF Lite file into the ML folder of your project. Let's check out the details of our imported model. From here, we can see an example of how to use the model in our app. Let's move over to the main activity class to take advantage of it. Inside of our image capture callback here on line number 78, we create an instance of our model. Next, we use it to process the captured image here on line number 84. And finally, here on lines 92 through 98, we display the results of consuming the output inside of a toast message. Let's run our app. Now, instead of telling us it's looking at a leaf or a plant, it can actually tell us if it's looking at a bean leaf and give a diagnosis. Sweet. So this concept works, but it's very much a raw demo. What if we wanna make this a more successful app? Well, we'd probably need to add services like authentication so our users can sign in analytics and A-B testing so we can find out how our users are really interacting with our app, some crash reporting or performance monitoring, and an easy way to save our users' data to the cloud. Luckily, that's where Firebase comes in. Now, the new and improved Firebase plugin in Android Studio makes this simple. I'll start by adding some analytics so I can find out exactly how our users are interacting with our app. And the plugin does most of the work to get the library integrated into my project. Now that I've done that, well, we can uh, get an instance of the library up here, and then we can log what kind of results we're getting from MLKit. And then once we've done that, there's a lot of ways to get at this data. It'll start showing up here in the Firebase dashboard, but I find one really fun way of viewing this data is to use StreamView, which kind of gives you a real tiny sample of what kinds of analytics results we're seeing. Looks like I've already recorded several of these select content events, and I can dig into these event properties and see what kinds of results our users are getting. And I could start using that information to maybe refine my MLKit model or A-B test different alternatives. Firebase helps you build better apps and analytics is just the tip of the proverbial iceberg. 
Maybe we could let our users upload their own pictures and store them in the cloud using cloud storage for Firebase. There's so many possibilities. This is a sample app, but if we were to productize this, it's important to keep in mind how our AI design decisions impact our users. For instance, we need to consider if and or how it makes sense to display confidence intervals to help your users interpret the ML model output. Or say, how you design the onboarding experience sets user expectations for the capabilities and limitations of your ML-based app, which is vital to app adoption and engagement. For more guidance on AI design decisions, check out the People Plus AI Guidebook at pair.withgoogle.com slash guidebook. And don't forget about the web. I built a PWA that can be installed across all your users' platforms. It combines the web camera with TensorFlow.js, and by integrating machine learning, we can make an amazing experience that runs across all browsers. This isn't a finished project by any means, just a proof of concept for how a minimum viable product with a roadmap to completion can be put together using Google's developer tools and APIs. You might also want to open source this project too. We'd love to help you with this, and you can learn more about the process at opensource.guide slash starting a project. Hi, developers. My name is Annie Jean-Baptiste, and I'm the head of product inclusion at Google. The demo you just saw shows how Google's products can come together to create an amazing app. But what about product inclusion? You may be wondering, well, what is product inclusion and why is it important? At Google, we believe that giving power to new voices is the core of innovation. When we bring an inclusive lens to the product design process, we amplify underrepresented voices and allow all users to feel seen and validated in the moments that matter for them. We look beyond ourselves and seek out diverse voices to shape the products that we build. We also believe that we have a responsibility not to disappoint our users, no matter who they are, what they look like, how much money they make, who they love, how old they are, or anything that makes them them. And so when you're developing your own apps, I challenge you to incorporate the principles of product inclusion into the design process. Because we believe that you can do well and do good by being intentional about including underrepresented voices at key points in the product design process. Remember, those closest to the problem are also closest to the solution. You can learn more about product inclusion at Google by visiting accelerate.withgoogle.com. Hi, everyone. My name is Jen Cole, and I'm the Global Developer Communities Program Manager at Google. Now it's time to meet and hear from your local developers. These sessions will cover a variety of technologies, such as Android, Google Cloud Platform, machine learning with TensorFlow, Web, Firebase, Google Assistant, and Flutter. Follow at GDG on Twitter for highlights from DevFest around the world, and try out the DevFest AR filter and avatar. Share what you're learning or your favorite part about the event on social media with hashtag DevFest. Hello everyone, I'm Louisa from the Google Developers team, and I'd like to welcome you today to the very first UK and Ireland DevFest. We're really sorry we can't be together in person, but I know you're gonna have a brilliant time with us today, as it's a rare opportunity to get to hear from and interact with developers from across the UK and Ireland and beyond. I'll hand over to Jen now, one of the main organizers of today, to tell you more about what we've got lined up for you. Enjoy DevFest. Thank you, Louisa. Hi, everyone. I'm Jen Ashley, and I'm one of the many GDG leads who are delivering this event to you today. There are 16 Google developer groups who came together to plan and create a wonderful event for you. We are also joined by two developer student clubs who have been very active in spreading the word to the student community in the UK and Ireland. I feel very fortunate and happy to have worked with these 29 other individuals to deliver this to you today. Please meet the team. So thank you to this wonderful team and to you, our attendees and speakers. Thank you for being here and enjoy the rest of the conference.
Hi, my name's Rachel. I'm with GDG Belfast and Women Tech Makers Belfast. Um, thank you for joining us today on the diversity, equity and inclusion track. Um, we just have a few slides to run through and then we will get started with our first speaker. So first of all, our code of conduct is available at this link. Um, please be respectful and mindful to other people whenever you're posting comments or tweeting or um, posting anything on social media. We'd also encourage you to use the hashtags, hashtag DevFest and hashtag DevFestUKI. Um, if you are using these in your social media posts, this will put you into a draw for some prizes at the end of the day at our after party. So I will now hand you over to Erica and Jana as your hosts for the first part of today. Enjoy. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Jana, I'm from GDG Galway. Hi, I'm Erica, I'm with GDG Glasgow. And so this morning we have a fantastic lineup. We're starting with Claire Byrne. She's going to be discussing adventures in time complexity and data structure. Then we move on to Gozia Sita. She's got confidence and credibility online. And then Chloe Thompson is going to be discussing data, AI, and why women matter. So it should be a very interesting morning. Good morning, Claire. Can you hear us? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, we got you. Oh, sorry. How are you doing this morning? Uh, yeah, ground, doing well. How about you? Good. Yeah, pretty good. Awesome. Um, will I just share my screen then and get started? Yeah, take it away. Cool. Can you all see that? You should be able to see my slides right now. Yeah. Cool. Now we can. Okay. Awesome. There's always this kind of awkward, like, getting set up with virtual conferences, isn't there? <laughs> Especially first thing in the morning. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right. I'll launch right in then. Um, so it's a truth universally acknowledged that coding interviews are usually uncomfortable. You're on the spot. You're usually on your own and you're trying to think under immense amounts of pressure whilst trying to show your absolute best self. If you're lucky, you'll have an encouraging interviewer, but if you're not, well, it's just not really a nice experience. So what I'm going to do in this next 20 minutes is try and make the experience a little less daunting by giving you a heads up on what you need to know to be able to keep your cool, equip you with the foundational know-how to solve problems from first principles if necessary, making sure you're ready for anything. So my name is Claire Byrne. Um, I'm a data engineer at Rapid7 in Belfast, Northern Ireland, and I've been volunteering with Women Tech Makers for about five, five years now. And at this stage, I'm a bit of a veteran at coding interviews. So one of the most unexpected things I've learned over the course of many, many interviews is it's really important to practice. Being good at technical interviews is a skill, not an innate talent, and it can be learned, believe it or not. So let's jump right in. Everybody loves data structures, right? I know the phrase sends a chill up a lot of people's spines, but actually, personally, I'm in love with the concept of data structures. Just as a blacksmith's tools are their hammers and a painter's tools are their brushes, the tools of a software engineer are data structures and the algorithms that can be built from them. You don't need to be able to recite the code for these off by heart, but you need to have an idea of what they are and how they're used. To continue with the analogy, if a painter has no knowledge of how, a, say, a palette knife works, they're going to use a brush for oil paints and end up with a less desirable result than they could have achieved otherwise. So what I'm really trying to say with this analogy is, you can't use your most effective tool if you don't know it exists. So awareness of the advantages and disadvantages of these data structures is key. Each data structure can be used for a different purpose to perform a different task and meet a different goal. And it's important to have all these tools in your belt when you're asked to tackle a problem of our trade by an interviewer usually. So I know this looks like a lot and there are many, many more data structures obviously, but it's not all that bad, honestly. A lot of data structures are subsets of a few main ones. So if you take a step back, 
we can see that stacks and queues can be implemented using a linked list. Similarly, heaps and tries are a subset of trees, and trees are subsets of graphs. They're a form of acyclic undirected graph if you want to get specific, but it's fine. And arrays, which are sometimes known as vectors, um, these are one of the ways in which we can build hash maps or associative arrays. So this is all a bit technical for this time in the morning, but I'm going to do my best to break it down. Um, let's explore these in more, de in, more, in more detail then, shall we? So linked lists are an ordered collection of objects, but they differ in structure from normal lists and arrays in that they don't have to be stored in contiguous memory space, and they don't have to contain data of the same type in each node. Linked lists aren't index-based, they store references to the next element of the list as part of each node. So in general, a linked list will have two parts to it, the data part and a pointer or reference to the next node in the list. So a linked list is simply just a collection of these nodes. The beginning node in the list is called the head and the last node in the list is distinguished by the fact that its next reference will point to null. So other data structures like queues, stacks, and even graphs in some languages are all implementations of linked lists. They can be useful for, for caches and lifecycle management within the operating system and lots of other things. So queues and stacks simply change the way that data is accessed within the structure. A queue is a first in first out data structure in general, meaning that data is inserted at the beginning and taken off at the end. Although there is a structure called a deck or a DQ, um, where items can be added to both the beginning and the end of the queue. So stacks are a last in first out data structure, where the last thing to be put on top of the stack is the first thing to be taken out or popped. So if you think of stacking and queuing objects in real life, you can't go far wrong. Stacks always have a pointer to the top element, which in turn points to the next one down, and so on. These structures can be implemented without using a linked list as a base, um, but I always find it very helpful to remember that they're essentially subsets of linked lists, it really simplifies the remembering the time and space complexities of the structures themselves, which I'll get to later. The next structure I'm going to talk about is trees. Everyone loves trees, right? I'm really branching out with this data structure. Ha, <laughs> first terrible joke of the morning. So within computer science, trees are a well-known non-linear data structure and they're used for absolutely everything. Your file system, it's a tree. A program function call graph? That's a tree too. They don't store data in a linear way, like linked lists, stacks, or vectors. They organize data hierarchically, and a tree is made up of nodes of data connected by pointers called edges. So I love tree data structures because they use a ton of actual tree analogies that make a lot of sense. So for example, the last nodes in a tree that don't have any other child nodes are known as leaves. And the tree always has a starting node, classified as the root node, at the very top of the hierarchy. So the most basic thing you need to know about trees is that each node is in a tree stores pointers to its child nodes. There are many different types of trees and many different ways of getting data out of them called traversals. If you know how to traverse a tree, and which type of tree is appropriate for the task at hand, I'd say you could solve almost any problem. Plant a tree, solve a problem. So I'm going to take you through the types of traversal of a structure called a binary search tree. So this is probably one of the most important types of tree that you'll come across, and many other types of tree stem from this one structure. Ha, oh, that was an unintentional tree pun. Not really. <laughs> a binary search tree, or an ordered binary tree, is a type of tree where the nodes are arranged in order. So for example, for each node, all elements in its left subtree are less than or equal to the root node and all elements in its right subtree are greater than the root node, as you can see in the diagram here. So you can traverse these trees in a couple of ways, and that, that just means getting the data out of them in, in different ways. Um, but the data is organised in different ways, that means. So in-order traversal is the first one I'm going to talk about, and it's a very commonly used on binary search trees because it returns values from the underlying set in order. Um, so that would return 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 in this example here. Um, so pre-order traversal, uh, while duplicating nodes and values, can make a complete duplicate of a binary tree, so that's why that's useful. 
This is commonly used in compiler design um, and embedded system design as well. It's very space efficient. And then post order traversal, which you can see here is traversing the left subtree, the right subtree, and then the root. Um, that can be useful for deleting a, or freeing an entire binary tree from memory. So there's, there's a couple of ways of searching a tree. Um, so depth first search can be implemented easily using a stack and breadth first search, which is just where you traverse a tree by level rather than by depth, as we've talked about here. Um, that can be implemented using a queue. So as I said, all data structures are intertwined very nicely. And once you start learning about one part, it's easy to get the hang of others. So a heap is a complete binary tree based structure with specific ordering properties. The ordering can be one of two types, so a max heap or a min heap. And in a max heap, the value of each node is less than or equal to the value of its parent node. So that basically means that the greatest value is at the root. Um, that, must, that property must be true for all subtrees. And just as you'd guess, a min heap is the opposite of that. So the value of each node is greater than or equal to the value of its parent. So this is really, really important for like creating stuff like like priority queues in operating systems and stuff like that. Um, and personally, I've been asked about heaps a few times in interviews, so it's a good one to know. So hash maps, dictionaries, and associative arrays then. These are all the same thing. And I can guarantee you've used these in a programming language without realizing. They're essentially data structures that allow for key value mappings. And they come as built-in data structures in most languages, including Python, Ruby, and JavaScript. So how do they differ from normal arrays and lists then? And why are they so much better? Well, we can think of a hash map like a set of drawers, and each drawer has a label. If we want to access something from those drawers, we don't have to go through all the other drawers of stuff to, to find what we're, looking, what we're looking for. We simply open the drawer called, well, say we're looking for a book, the drawer called books, and search there. So what does this translate to in computer science then? If I want to access the value of a certain key, I can go straight to that key in a hash map. If I was using an array instead to hold all my values, I would have to go through every index sequentially until I find the value I'm looking for. That's not very efficient. Okay, so there's a lot more to data structures, but I'm going through this quite quickly. Um, in the interest of time, let's launch right into one of the most important concepts you'll ever need to know for a tech interview, big O notation. Ooh. That was an attempt at a really bad big O joke, just to check you're awake. So just what is big O notation then? Big O notation is used in computer science to describe the performance or complexity of an algorithm. It's highly likely that within at least one part of your tech interview, you'll be asked some questions on algorithms, specifically how to solve a problem and improve and iterate on your solution. It's really important to be able to talk about code in relation to its time complexity because everyone wants fast code, right? And I found that learning about Big O has improved my algorithm algorithmic thinking in a really big way. So specifically, Big O describes the worst case scenario of an algorithm, and it can be used to describe the execution time required or the memory space used by an algorithm. Um, there are more theoretical mathematical ways of describing the best case and the tightly bound best case and worst cases, but honestly, at this time of the morning, and unless you're pursuing a PhD in the topic, the only one that's ever used in industry is Big O. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is constant time algorithms then, Big O or Big O1. So this describes an algorithm that will always execute in the same time, regardless of the input data set. So a silly real world example of this would be sending a file via an airplane to a friend. The size of the file doesn't matter. There are other bottlenecks here. No matter how big the file gets, the time will stay the same. Another more grounded example of this would be the code snippet here. The size of the array won't affect the time this function takes to run, as it's just checking the first element of the array. And that's never going to get bigger or anything or move. It'll just always be the first element of the array. So, this is a simple example that denotes searching through a list for a specific string. 
and describes linear time. So for each element in this list, it compares the element to a desired element and then returns if, if it's found. But we don't know where the element we're searching for will be in the list, and it could potentially be at the very end of the list, which, if this data structure is long, will take more time. So how do we denote this in big O notation then? The time is going to grow linearly with the size of the data structure. And so with the size of the list being n, time complexity will be big O n. This example also demonstrates how big O favors the worst case for performance scenario. So a matching string could be found during any iteration of the for loop and the function would return early. But big O notation always just assumes the upper limit where an algorithm will perform the maximum number of iterations. Does that make sense? So the next one I'll talk about is square proportional time and we're starting to get a bit more complicated here. Um, so this example here goes through an array and for every element it will go over every other element in the array and print out the element in focus alongside the other elements in the array. You can visualize this if you write it out simply with an array containing the numbers one, two, and three. So here we have that. Um, so yeah, I'll just go through the example here because n squared runtimes can be quite hard to visualize. Um, so each of the numbers in the array, we're going to pair it with each of the other numbers in the array, starting with the first number. So this is going to result in a sort of square matrix which means that the runtime will be exactly what it looks like, the square of the length of the array. This is also true for the space complexity of this piece of code, although in interviews I find that time complexity is more of a pressing issue than space complexity. It's still useful to know, but I'm, I'm going to mostly cover time complexities here. So the next one is big O two to the power of n. So, yeah, again, this is all looking very scary, but it's actually quite simple if you break it down. So the growth curve of a, a big O two to the power of n function is exponential. It starts off very shallow and then it rises meteorically. So an example of a big O two to the power of n function is the recursive calculation of Fibonacci numbers, um, which can be visualized here. So a lot of people will see two calls to each function on each level and jump to the conclusion that this is big O n squared. So this isn't quite right and I'll show you why here. So each recursive iteration calls itself twice and this is a very important pattern to remember. Often when faced with a recursive function, the runtime will be the number of times each recursive call branches to the power of the input dataset length. So you'll be glad to know this is our last one. Um, on to big O log n. So this can be a bit of a tricky one to explain again, but essentially, if it's the opposite of exponential, it's probably big o, big o log n. The best way to identify it is to think of all those algorithms where the problem space is reduced by half on each pass of the algorithm. I'll illustrate this with an example. So you've probably heard of binary search. This is a technique used to search sorted data sets. It works by selecting the middle element of the data set and compares it against a target value, as you can see in the example here. Um, if the target value is higher than the value of the, the probe element, it will take the upper half of the data set and perform the same operation against it. Likewise, if the target value is lower, it will perform the operation against the lower half. So it continues to halve the data set with each iteration until a value has been found or until it can no longer split the data set. So basically the iterative, hal iterative halving of data sets described in a binary search algorithm uh, produces a growth curve that peaks at the beginning and then slowly flattens out as the size of the data set decreases. So doubling the size of the input data set would effectively have little effect on its growth. So here you can see a big O complexity chart which nicely illustrates um, the time complexities, I guess. And it just, it really helps to memorize this. So now I've completely overloaded you with information. Uh, I'll leave you with a few awesome links that I used to build this presentation and that I've, I've used for study in the past. You don't need to be a super duper expert to be able to pass a coding interview, but a solid foundation and a few data structures in your mental toolbox can work wonders.
for your confidence during a tech screen. Remember to talk through your thought process and treat the interviewer as a colleague, not an enemy. They're there to help and see how you think. And a good interview should be collaborative and helpful when you're stuck. So the book at the top here um, is essentially the golden rule book when it comes to tech interviews. And it's helped me to understand big O notation better than I ever did in university. Um, also, the resources here by Julia Evans and Mariam Jaludi explain difficult tech concepts in fun and interesting ways. And I have so much respect for these women. And those last two are GitHub resources that have exercises and coding tips. And I find I find Yang Shun's book particularly useful. So I'd really recommend that. So with that, um, I'll say thank you so much for listening and feel free to contact me at any of these points on any of these socials. I'm Claire Byrne. I'm a global ambassador for women who code and a volunteer for women tech makers. And thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Claire. That was a great presentation. And, thank you. Uh, just, to keep, <laughs> uh, just to keep the bad puns rolling, uh, if anyone wants to tweet heaps of free puns at you, uh, just don't forget to tag um, hashtag DevFest and hashtag DevFestUKI. So we're very pro pun. Thanks so much for hosting. Thank you. So our, our next speaker will be uh, Goshia, uh, Goshia Seda uh, talking about a different um, topic. This time will be uh, confidence and credibility online, which deals more so about the personal uh, personal aspect of how, how we, especially as women, present ourselves and how, how we um, um, make the impact we should within the company that is, that is mainly um, um, male dominated. Um, I'm very interested in this uh, talk. Uh, Gosh, uh, Goshia actually has a hello, Goshia. <laughs> um, hey. well, welcome. Um, uh, Goshia is actually a founder of the communication uh, skills consultancy Walk Your Talk. I think I could really use your services. Um, uh, and you have an online group program you've developed. Is that since um, since COVID times or? Uh, before. Yes, yes. Great. other times I have to go online like everyone else. That, that That's great. So it's called the Personal Impact Incubator. Um, it, it sounds, I'm really happy that something like this is out there. Um, but maybe I'll let you, I'll let you go ahead with your, uh, with your presentation. If, if Thank, you're you. Thank you very much for introducing me. First of all, before we uh, kick off, I would like to, you to put in chat, how many hours a day do you spend in virtual meetings? Is it just a few minutes, an hour, several hours? Let me know. I would like to see where we are with virtual meetings. How long do you spend in front of the computer every day? There is a little bit of lag, so I'm still waiting for your answers to come in. Waiting, waiting, waiting. I'm on Mac, but it feels like Windows. <laughs> okay, uh, just unmute yourselves and tell me how long uh, how long you spent online because I still can't see anything in the chat and I'm getting nervous. <laughs> Uh, two, the four, six hours a day, Natasha. Oh my God, commiseration. Uh, anyone who spends even more than that? About 10 hours, Andrew? Okay, how do we feel about um, being in online meetings? Is it, do we love them? Do we hate them? It's complicated. Six hours every day. How do we feel about being in front of the computer and meeting with people online rather than in real life? Is it a good thing, not so good, or is, is it com a complicated relationship? I can't see anything yet. So, uh, Erica or, or Jana, I can see you, so I'll pick on you. How do you feel about online meetings? 
I, I, I had to transition from uh, tutoring in person. Um, I just finished my master's there, but I had to uh, transition from tutoring my tutors in per uh, my students in, in person to doing it online. And that, that was, it was a bit scary. It was quite scary at like at first because, you know, you're just there and they're in your room and it's, it's, um, yeah, and it's I, how many people you can fit into your room, right? Yeah. Uh, how many people are there in this conference today? Over a thousand, I believe. Over a thousand. So you yeah. are sitting in front of a thousand people who you cannot see. So you can't really, you are talking. You don't know if they're listening or checking out their email. You don't know what they make of what you are saying because you can't see any reactions. And it can really undermine uh, your confidence. And, and you can start getting more and more nervous. So that the, the, that's the bad news about uh, online meetings. The good news is that we can do a lot to improve the way we look and by doing so start feeling more confident. So we'll start about our first impression. So let me put uh, up my slides. This is my first one. First impressions. Uh, and you know, it takes very little time for people to, uh, to make a first impression of you. Um, people think it's, oh, it's a few seconds. It's not even that. Uh, it's one tenth of a second. That's how long it takes people to decide if you are credible, confident, trustworthy, and likable. So what happens during uh, this time, one tenth of a second, is not much. You don't even have a chance to open your mouth to speak. So people judge you on your nonverbal behaviors. By the way, you look, your gender, your age, your race. These are the things that we cannot really change. But people also judge you on the nonverbal behaviors that you um, that you display, which is the way you sit or the way you stand, the way you uh, keep or don't keep eye contact, the way you move. Um, these are all the elements that we can work with and we can change. And it's not rocket science. So. But before we uh, before we join a meeting uh, where we want to make a good first impression, we need to do some prep. And uh, before we even, even, even join a meeting, we need to make sure, first of all, that our background is more or less decent because we've seen we've seen it all. We've seen socks on the radiators. We've seen empty beer bottles in the background. We've seen pet eagles. I don't know. That might just be me. Anyway, we've seen it all. So if we want to come across as confident and credible, we need to make sure that our background uh, is un is fairly uncluttered and professional. Um, if our background is busy, people will uh, start uh, looking at what's uh, what's behind you and stop concentrating on what you have to say. And you know by now how, how difficult it is to keep people's attention as it is. So um, make sure that your background is not busy. Make sure that uh, there are not any auditory um, distractions such as kids, pets, other members of the family. If you've got kids, you know how, how challenging it is to get them to be quiet for uh, for the duration of your call. So do whatever it takes. I tend to go between blackmailing them or uh, trying to bribe them with chocolate. So whatever works, make sure that they don't interrupt you in an important meeting so that you have the peace of mind to continue with it. And one last thing about uh, the, the first impressions on Zoom, before you enter uh, the room, other virtual platforms are also available. Before you enter the room, uh, make sure that your camera is off so you control when, um, when people see you for the first time. And then switch it on when you're ready. And when you are ready, when you position yourself in front of your camera, and that means your 
eyes should be at the same level as your camera because then and only then will all you be able to create an impression that you look at people you look in their eyes rather than um looking down or looking up make sure that if 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 you if you if your laptop is on on the table you will be looking down at it so elevate it just put a few books under it and make sure your eyes are level with the camera and then look look at the camera smile and switch your camera on and don't forget to unmute yourself uh, because then all your prep might go to waste if you if you if you enter the room and people cannot hear you so that's tip number one out of six make a good first impression when you enter the room tip number two take up space we judge people's confidence authority and status by the amount of space they take up we are very much territorial animals so we assume that a, well, if a person takes up a lot of space he or she has a lot of authority so if we can try it now and if you would like to uh, sit down uh, take, take up all the space that you have on your armchair or on your chair put your or both your your legs down keep your feet about a shoulder distance uh, apart you should now feel quite grounded make sure that you take up the whole of your chair up until the back put your put your arms on the armrests if you have any sit up straight keep your head level if you if you have a problem keeping your heart, head level like i do from from years of sitting in front of the camera uh, imagine you have a crown on your head and you don't want it to slip off that will help you keep your head straight and in this position if you assume this expansive big open body position it's very difficult it, you first of all you, you feel seem very confident and second of all it's very difficult to feel nervous because our body speaks to our mind and if our mind sees our body so relaxed and open and expansive it comes to a conclusion well things must be okay because if they weren't if there was some danger in the immediate environment she wouldn't be seen sitting like this so uh, you you create this virtuous circle circle by um by displaying confident body language and this is something that we don't normally think of because we know that we when we when people feel confident they look a certain way they are very expansive they make themselves big but uh, the, uh, our mind and body works both ways. So even if we don't feel particularly confident, we can trick our mind into thinking that we actually are by assuming a confident body position. So that's tip number two. Make sure that you sit big and you take up as much space as possible. And to do so, uh, you also need to uh, fill the frame. So you need to be the focal point. If you look look at the difference between this, when I when I uh, move away from the camera, I instantly get smaller and less significant. You can't see my face as well. You can't connect with with, with my eyes. And look at that. When I fill the camera nicely the contact between us is much, much better. Going on to tip number three, keep eye contact. In, if we, you keep eye contact with people, people believe that we, it's, it's a conversation. And in real life, it's much, much easier because we are face to face with people and the eye contact 
is not expected to be as intense as in the virtual space. In real life, we use eye contact, we look at other people around, for around 60-70% of the time. Any less than that, and people with, will think you are not interested or maybe nervous, any more than that, and it gets really creepy. But in the virtual space, the expectation is different. It's like you are on TV, and when we see a presenter on TV, we expect them to look in the camera all the time. So the expectation in virtual meetings is very much the same. So look people in the eye by looking at the camera lens. If you want, and it, I know it's quite difficult and it sounds artificial, uh, feels artificial, but when you look at the gallery view like I'm looking now, if I did it for a longer period, you would think that either I was um, checking my email or maybe looking at my notes. So look at the uh, look at the camera straight at the camera, and this is is not natural. Doesn't uh, and re requires a lot of um, iterations. Uh, but at some point, it will start growing on you and it will come natural. One more tip, you might want to hide your self-view because um, it makes you feel really self-conscious. And if you see yourself on the camera while you speak, the, the temptation is always, you know, to mess with your head or, oh no, this isn't this, or check if your makeup isn't running. So, uh, hide yourself of you it will give you a lot of peace of mind tip number which number are we at we are num at number four and number four as you can see i don't have my notes on the on the screen i have them on my slides uh tip number four is show me your hands we people are conditioned to look out for people's hands and there is a very good reason for it. Namely, uh, in, in uh, the course of evolution, we found out that hands are marvelous things. They can create things. They can stroke babies' uh, heads. They can cook dinner, but they can also hurt people. And it, that's why um, people in the past, thousands of thousands of years ago, developed this thing about, you know, paying attention to people's hands in case there is something in those hands that might hurt them. So we are much the same these days, even though in the office people normally don't carry, you know, stones or spears. We still look out for people's hands and we want to see them. If, um, if I uh, kept my hands uh, below the, the desk all the time when speaking to you, subconsciously, after some time, you would start wondering, where are her hands? What are they doing? I don't feel comfortable. Uh, the interesting thing is that when um, pol it's, it's, our hands give you an idea about our intentions. And uh, there are very two good examples of how that works. One is about lying and one is about uh, dangerous situations. When you lie, your, your hands tend to disappear. When you're a child, you will put your hands behind your back and make it really obvious. When you are <clears throat> when you are an adult, you are more subtle with it. You might put it under, put your hands under the desk, or put them in your pockets, um, or just clench them. Do you remember this uh, this line? I have never had sexual relations with that woman right? Bill Clinton. We didn't see his open hands that he normally has when he speaks. 
<clears throat> Another thing is um, when we have an intention to hurt someone, our, our, our hands go like this. So when policemen are trained in the police academy, they are taught to look out for this signal. This signal means trouble. Even if, if, the head, if, if the fists are not raised, they are still down by the sides of, uh, of the person's body. When they go like this, it means that the person is preparing to strike. So to put everyone at ease in the meeting, make sure that your hands are visible and open. It also serves another purpose. Your hands underline what you say and they illustrate some some points and by doing so they make it easier for people to follow what you have to say research has shown that not only that people remember up to 40 percent more of what you have said if you use your hand gestures so it's really important for you guys when you present and you present on highly technical subjects it's important that your hands speak with you this this way people will understand what you have to say more and they will remember what you've said better tip number five embrace stillness especially in your head movement attracts attention and that's very distracting when i don't know if you've uh, if you sometimes have in your meetings people who move a lot in in the gallery view and it's really distracting when especially when you're a speaker and you see someone you know fidgeting somewhere uh, on the screen uh, that's one thing another thing is when you move a lot uh, you create an impression that you are really nervous especially when there is a lot of movement in our head and research shows that especially women we work our heads a lot we do this yes i agree i'm with you i'm listening we do that oh yeah oh i can i can i get you it's it's really hard um and you know if you don't have control over your head and you go like this all the time people will think you don't have control over anything else so keep your head still and if you um if you can think of any films that you uh you've seen with kings and queens in them kings and queens are very still because and there are many moments in kings and queens lives that they want to project authority and authority is about stillness kings and queens don't move much they don't rush through their words everything moves around them so if you want to project authority keep your head still especially when you make an important point don't go like this it's very tempting and i do it all the time because i want people to know that i'm listening and i'm with them but if you want to project authority control your head last uh the, the last uh, tip for today is smile smile is a wonderful gesture it really connects you with other people the, the only two uh, reservations that I would have about smiling is make sure that it's not your default e facial expression. We, uh, some of us, myself included, uh, want things to feel okay for people in a meeting. So we smile a lot, even if we have no reason for it. We smile when we want to cover other emotions when we are embarrassed we smile when we are annoyed we smile even when we are angry we sometimes smile and that really undermines your credibility if that's your default facial expression a smile it really makes people think twice whether you are a trustworthy person that can that is best for the job that's in front of you 
Also, when you smile when there is no reason for it, your, people can tell it's a fake smile. Because we, when you smile uh, without real intention behind it, without having a real reason for it, you smile only here. Your smile doesn't reach your eyes as you as uh, just like like your genuine smile would. So these muscles don't work, and you just stretch your mouth. Your, the, the corners of your mouth don't even go up as in uh, as they do in a real smile. They you you just stretch your uh, lips, and people can tell. It's this kind of smile when you see someone you who are you are not really keen on. You go like hi. Whereas when you see someone who you really like, your lights will light up and your, the corners of, of your lips will go up and you will produce this lovely smile, your genuine smile. So these were my six tips. One more thing that I want to say um, that you would like to avoid other than fidgeting is has to do with hands. People need to see our hands but the thing that we should not do with our hands because it undermines our credibility is to touch ourselves and this is really tempting when we are stressed in, a, in an important presentation or a meeting because touch calms us down so we when we are nervous we automatically go like so right oh like so it's really nice it's very reassuring and it does its job brilliantly. It's just that re it really undermines our credibility. So when you speak in an important meeting, make sure that you don't touch yourself. So these were my six tips. Make sure you make a, a good first impression when you enter the room. Take up a lot of space and fill the frame nicely. Look people in the eye, that is, into the lens of your camera. Show me your hands, keep them vis visible. Embrace stillness and control your head. And smile, a genuine smile. And if you take control of those nonverbal behaviors, these will set you up for success in the virtual meetings. Confidence for me is, is a decision we make before we join a, a meeting. It's an intention we set for ourselves. And even if we don't feel it really deep down, we can display it and people will trust whatever they see. And at some point, those confident behaviors will grow on you uh, with, with repetition and with the good feedback that you receive as, as a result of projecting confidence in your virtual meetings. So good luck with your meetings, presentations, sales pitches, job interviews, whatever it is you need confidence for. Please use all those tips for good, not for evil. Thank you very much. If you have more, much a bit more time, I'm not sure. I can. I'm, I'm happy to answer your questions. We have uh, we have a bit more time here. Thank you so much. These um, these tips are really useful uh, for me as well as I'm I'm just entering the the market now uh, or the market. Sorry, I'll I'll be looking for work for work now uh, as a recent graduate. There are some really interesting tips, and I'll I'll try to. I'll try to employ them as we speak. <laughs> I wish I had spoken to you a few moments before <laughs> before this uh, presentation. Instead, uh, there, um, yeah, very, this is great. This and also Claire, together with Claire's talk, this is uh, very useful for um, recent graduates or for people looking for work. Because one thing is to know the technical um, the technical aspects of the interview, but yeah, presentation is a very important aspect. Sorry, presentation is important. <laughs> all the time. It's just the, the, the non-verbals. It's it's something that we don't think about. But if you start thinking about it, it's really important how we present ourselves because this is talking all the time. Even if your mouth is closed, we still judge you on the way you present yourself. So, so, 
<laughs> so you it, hide off the camera. <laughs> awareness of you know people uh, pe people are, are are looking at me and I'm telegraphing always something, and and our body language is really really honest. So people, about just by looking at us and how, how we hold ourselves, they can tell a lot about how confident we feel, how much status we have, what we really, really think, uh, how we think, what our attitude to this, in this situation is. Loads and loads of information is in how we are, right, um, we say. That that's um uh, wait sorry still head <laughs> no don't, don't 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 freak out it's just... <laughs> what would you say about keeping the head still but sideways my head tends to fall sideways when i'm talking i've been informed <laughs> it's, uh, when we, well, it's a sign of empathy i'm i'm the same and it, it's it's a sign of empathetic listening so it's it's super nice for people when they speak to you and you do this they know that you are listening and that you are really present in this situation. But if you are like all the time, you look like a little puppy, and <laughs> it, it 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 can it can hurt your your credibility in important situations. And as I said, all those tips about confidence and you you know power, strength, use them like chili with you know not too much of it. There are situations that call for you know authority but don't overdo it look at people like michelle obama or for guys in the room barack obama they are both really confident and authoritative but they are also really really warm this is not a subject of this talk but we need a balance between the two so don't i don't want you to make yourself crazy about you know oh are my hands visible is my head still no it's just you know in those important moments ask yourself how do i want to come across and follow the tips i've given you today very very good um erica did, yeah, you, did you yeah they were they were really interesting tips but i definitely caught myself the whole time you were talking like Suddenly, I was very aware of what I was doing with my hands, and I was fidgeting a little bit. And it was, it was all those little check-ins where I'm like, "Oh no, I need to, I need to readjust my body." And I've got a busy background. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's, it's it's unnerving when you not, when you acquire this knowledge about nonverbal signals. You can, if, and I said, I certainly, uh, certainly was this way at the beginning. Uh, when I, I I have so I have background in social psychology, so this is where my knowledge comes from, and then I was super self conscious, um, but then um, I uh, I learned how to use those tips in the high stakes situations, uh, and it helped me to shift my focus from being very nervous about oh uh, how do people see me to oh is my head still. Uh, is, uh, do I sit big or stand big? And it's you just concentrate on very tangible things, things that you can control. And that's, that for me uh, took a lot of stress away from potentially stressful situations. Um, we, we have a, a question for you here from uh, Nadia Parsons, if you wouldn't mind answering it. Um, so could you share any tips uh, on how to prepare or calm yourself uh, before an important meeting? Oh, absolutely. Uh, first of all, uh, there, there are three things that you can you, you need to do before an important meeting if you want to come, uh, if, if you are really, <clears throat> if you really care for making a really good first impression. And you, you need to remember body, breath, and buzz. So your body, do something physical. Whatever it is, do a power pose. If, you, if you've heard about Amy Cuddy, you know about power posing. Do a little dance, jump around, or just walk from one room to another. Do something physical to bring your energy levels up and your, um, and your tension down. We hold a lot of tension in our body, and it doesn't help because it, it's, it, it makes you more and more nervous. And it also affects the way you breathe. That's the second point, body, breath. Uh, it restricts your breathing. When you, when you are very stressed, as we all are now, 
or all three of us on screen because so many people are watching, you sometimes forget to breathe. And if you don't uh, breathe enough, if you don't take enough breath in, you can't finish your sentences and they fizzle out at the end and make you, uh, make you sound very insecure and not confident. And uh, so, so remember breathing and breathe through your belly. It's not a sexy look, but it's a much more effective way of breathing uh, and of taking in enough air. We women uh, chest breathe a lot. I don't know, if, uh, ladies, how you breathe. When you breathe, what, what moves? Your chest or your belly? Well, now I'm trying to make the belly move. <laughs> probably, <laughs> probably the chest. But if I asked you to take in a big breath, I would, I would see this. You would be uh, breathing up and down instead of in and out. So love your bellies and start using them for breathing because this way you will take in much more breath than you can do when you breathe here. Uh, so body, breath and buzz. Do some um, vocal uh, warm up. Like go, you can, you can, you can hum, you can buzz, uh, or just talk to other people. Make sure that when you go on an important call, it's not, you know, the first time you speak in a day because it will show your energy will not be there, and yeah, you people will see that you are just warming up. Do your warm up before body, breath, and buzz. Perfect. Um, uh, gosh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, all of your tips have been very, very helpful. Um, it was great having you here. Um, so Thank we'll, we'll um, yeah, have a, have a nice day. Thank, Thank you so much for having me. Uh, and, uh, so. yeah, and good luck with the, with the rest of, of your conference. Thank you. Thank we'll you. be very confident for it now. On. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Well, that was fantastic, but now I'm going to be really conscious of my hands for the rest of the day. <laughs> uh, so, our next speaker. Sorry? Don't you can, can't adjust? I know. I keep doing it. I keep adjusting my glasses, and halfway up there, I catch myself. It's terrible. <laughs> uh, so, our next speaker is from. Uh... Sorry. <laughs> I got caught up in my own head again. Uh, she's from Queen's University in Belfast. We've got Chloe Thompson talking about data, AI, and why women matter. And I think it is such a, an important topic to be talking about right now. Just AI is, it's just coming up everywhere. It seems like, especially in the news lately, it's just all the Facebook algorithms, everything is just constant. So, hi, Chloe, how's it going? Hi, how are you? I have uh, was watching the last one and I'm a very handsy person. So now I'm thinking, do I do more hands or less hands? <laughs> Don't think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I take it I'll get started then. Yeah, okay. So, hi everybody. Um, it is great to be here today at DevFest. So, I hope you're all ready for a great Dev Talks. Um, I know I had my morning coffee before I came on, so I'm all ready and excited to go. So, welcome to this session on data, AI, and why women matter. So, when I sat down and I wrote the proposal for this talk, it was possibly around March time, just before the start of the pandemic. And the focus was very much women-led for Women Tech Makers Belfast's conference. But given everything that's going on in the world and the fact that representation is more than just women, I'm going to make a few points today that are slightly wider than that. So before we start, I guess a little introduction is in order. So hi, I'm Chloe, um, and like the girls said, I'm a final year student at Queen's University Belfast. Um, I've been working, mentoring, volunteering, and teaching in the AI and data space for the last few years. As of right now, I'm working in insurance at Aflac Northern Ireland. I'm a collaborator at Artificial Intelligence Northern Ireland, 
and I'm doing my final year project in natural language processing. So let's get started. I'm going to give you a bit of background first as to where this talk initially came from. In 2019, a book took the women in tech community by storm. I would be happy to take guesses, but I'm sure you all know where this is going. The best-selling book, Invisible Women, by Caroline Criado Perez, outlined a long-standing problem that leaves almost 50% of the world's population unrecognized. And it was all through the use of data. The book uncovers how everyday items, technologies and experiences from the size of a mobile phone and voice recognition software to restrooms are all designed for men. And it inhibits women's comfort and ultimately their safety. Now, I am a sucker for a good data-led decision. And I have to admit this book has been on my reading list for a long time, but I haven't got around to picking up a copy. And I know, I know, but I thought rereading Harry Potter for the one millionth time was a good idea. But rest assured, I have done my research and I'm ready to get into the AI and data-led decisions that scare me, but also how our digital data footprint can drive some change. It shouldn't be surprising that every time we access the internet, we leave a trail of data breadcrumbs behind us or that Facebook can classify around 52,000 traits on each person, or that Google holds around two to 50 gigabytes of data on each person. And that's everything from their morning commute to what recipes they Googled for dinner. Of course, with this large volume of data, corporations will start to use it to make decisions. And that can be from simple targeted marketing campaigns or more complex product changes based on consumer complaints and reviews. But with big data, there comes big responsibility. Let's take a look at where AI and data decisions have gone wrong. Ah, the famous example of recruitment. So in 2014, Amazon started to build an AI tool that would make their hiring process a piece of cake, or so they thought. They wanted the hiring dream to take all the applications for a job and narrow those down to a top number of candidates. What wasn't considered was the historical data they fed into this model. They created a data set of resumes from a previous 10 year period to train their model on. Of course, with the tech industry being male dominated and even more so in technical roles, their model was inherently biased. The model trained itself to prefer male candidates over female ones, picking up on words such as women's or women's coding club champion. And once the realization occurred that the model was biased against feminine words and language within a resume, they started to tweak the model to be neutral to those terms. But the project was eventually discarded around 2017 because they just can't guarantee it wasn't going to be biased. And since this model, there has been further research into using AI for recruitment and Amazon set up another team in Edinburgh to undertake a new project. The overarching goal was to create a model that could crawl the web and look for candidates worth recruiting. The model itself was set up to recognize 50,000 terms that showed up on previous candidates and successful hires resumes. It's as if they didn't learn. <laughs> The algorithm learned to assign little preference to technical capability and placed high importance on verbs more commonly present in male resumes, like the word executed or captured or executive. And according to Amazon, this project was also shut down and they never used either of these two models to make hiring decisions. But when we look at it, it wasn't the model's fault. It was entirely down to biased data. 
The Harvard Business Review conducted a piece of research as well on the success rate of female applicants to the research time on the Hubble Space Telescope. And this was to identify whether a bias towards male applicants existed and if anonymization of data made a difference for female applicants. They looked at 15,545 applications across 16 years between 2001 and 2018. And if that was me, I would be sick of looking at a resume. <laughs> Interestingly, the allocation committee for the Hubble telescope changed their approach to reviewing applications over this time because they noted there was a significant bias in the process. And in 2014, they removed applicant names to obscure gender and in later years, removed personally identifiable information. When the data was analyzed over that time period, the acceptance rate for anonymized applications showed an increase in the success rate for women's applications being accepted for research time. Now, there are studies being performed to reduce gender related language on resumes, and a lot of AI tooling is being implemented to anonymize gender or personally identifiable information. But sadly, the issues with resumes don't stop there. A study in Canada was run to understand whether names that sound foreign had an impact on hiring decisions. And they sent out over 7,000 CVs to a range of hiring managers and recruiters and across three Canadian cities. Now cleverly, they sent out the exact same resumes in some cases with the same fake background and fake educational experience, but one with an English name and one with a foreign name. And the results show that out of fictional applications, those with English sounding names were 35 to 40% more likely to be contacted by the employer. And that the callback rate for those with Indian or Chinese names had a further 10% decrease in that callback rate. However, it isn't always within the tech industry that biased decisions are made. With the lack of diversity in all walks of engineering, they're made all over the world in every company and in every industry. Until the last decade, it was unknown that the automotive sector was one of these. Did you know that a female driver is 17% more likely to be killed in a crash compared to a man? And that's even with a seatbelt. Or that women are 73% more likely to be injured in a frontal crash compared to men. But why is this the case? Well, in the 1970s, a vehicle crash test dummy standard was created, and they based this standard on the 50th percentile of male measurements, a fairly standard deviation process. Now, this resulted in a 171 pound, 5 foot 9 dummy. But regulators have been asking for a female dummy since the 1980s. And only in 2003 did regulators in the US comply. I suppose a thought of, well, some change happened, that's better than none, crossed your minds. But that dummy is sadly still inaccurate because they took the male dummy and they scaled it down, which means it only represents 5% of the smallest women in our population. And due to its size, it also doubles as the child dummy for the age range of 12 to 13. Now this makes it harder to protect smaller drivers who ultimately we normally sit closer to the steering wheel so that we can reach the pedals underneath and we sit more upright so that we can see over the dashboard. But because automotive companies' designs are inherent to the safety tests they have to pass, any bias that's needed to pass the test ends up in the manufacturing of the car. Now, by putting a female dummy in the front driver's seat and performing crash tests on a car that's designed for males, the car safety score plummets. And alongside that, the rating when it gets to the market. There's no financial gain or lawful safety regulation for car manufacturers to test with either representative dummies 
or simulate crash tests with representative data on female measurements. And because of that, they won't change. Now, recently I took part in a COVID-19 hackathon and I'll be honest, until then, I had no idea that data bias was present in the medical industry. And sadly, that's my privilege showing. And there were some amazing solutions created to tackle this problem from other teams. So I took to reading to understand this a bit more. And systemic racism underpins why healthcare is failing people of color and those in minorities. The facts and figures that you can see on the screen actually worry me because genetic traits for diseases, drug response and economic divides are leading to healthcare, so are leading to people of colour struggling to get adequate medical care. And scarily, some US hospitals thought they would create a machine learning algorithm to refer patients onto another health programme based on data that they threw into this model. The algorithm created a ranking score based on your medical factors, the symptoms that you had, the healthcare costs that you have occurred. But however, it consistently ranked black patients lower than white patients with similar symptoms. And in fact, only 17.7% of patients that received the extra care were black. And when that was manually analysed, it should have been 46.5%. So 50-50, like more or less. And while data insights and AI models could create revolutionary change in the world, it's just not going to be worth it if our systems are going to cost lives or not be representative. But hold up, it's not all doom and gloom. In fact, there are some companies that have got a data approach right. In fact, Social media plays a large part in this. A lot of companies perform what is known as social data mining. Now that's the collection of data from social media users on a range of platforms, so Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, to understand their consumers and the response their consumers have to either their product or their service. We all love a good rant on social media, but sometimes that data is used to change products or marketing campaigns to be more representative. Now, according to YouGov uh, research that was commissioned by Channel 4, 60% of people believe that the LGBTQ plus community is shown in a negative way in advertising. But one company got it right, and their ad took the community by storm. In November 2019, pre all the Christmas adverts that we normally see, the Renault Clio celebrated its 30th anniversary. At that statement, you're probably saying, wow, Chloe, what has a car anniversary got to do with diversity? And I hear you. The advertisement told the love story of an LGBTQ couple, the ups and downs, the issues of their parents not understanding, and the final moment of love prevailing. And when Adam Wood, the marketing director for Renault UK was interviewed, he said that their cars bring people's passion for life closer and that it's not just about celebrating the 30 years of progress for the Renault Clio, but the progress made within our culture and society over that time period. A clever but representative advertisement that, that, that left those in the community taking to Twitter to scream their praises for the Renault Clio. And personally, I would have loved to see their sales data after that advertisement. But while we take to Twitter to express our love, we also take to it to express our anger at the lack of representation. In 2016, the hashtag, hashtag Oscar so white, took the platform by storm. And it bashed the Oscars for their lack of nominations for people of color in the space. And the issue persisted into 2017, where no racial minorities were nominated and only four women made the list. Now the Academy faced masses of ridicule for their having fully white nominations and shutting out women directors. But as the issue with diversity and nominations persisted, so did the rally for change across social media 
and other mechanisms, of course, but eventually change happened. As of September 2020, not only will more diverse stories have to be told, but more pictures will have to hire more diverse people for both on the set and the crew behind the picture. For 2022 and 2023 films that are seeking best picture, they now have to submit an Academy Inclusion Standards form that's completely anonymous. And by 2024, all films are required to meet two of four standards as an effort to diversify what we see on screen and what is behind the screen. One way this can be achieved is by telling more stories from those in minority groups or LGBTQ backgrounds. As well as this, one of the lead actors or significant supporting actors has to be from an underrepresented or racial and ethnic group and 30% of secondary or supporting actors have to be from a further two underrepresented groups. These types of standards will see people of more racial, ethnic, gender, LGBTQ communities and cognitive or physical disabilities on our screens and the teams that make our films. And the saying of, you can't be what you can't see, will definitely start to be addressed in the coming years. Of course, not all change is because of social media data, but what we say online can have a strong impact and leave our digital data breadcrumbs full of insights. From brands pulling social media data to understand what their consumers think of their latest face cream, to companies throwing hiring data into a model and hoping that it will produce diverse results for our workplace. They're all taking the data that they have and trying to model an outcome. Of course, there are days where data horror stories rile us with fear and make us want to purge our digital footprint and throw our devices away and move into the middle of nowhere. But if we all express our thoughts in the lack of representation for minorities through our reviews and social media protests, then sometimes, just sometimes, that data ends up in the right place at the right time and positive change can be seen. So if I leave you with one message today, it's get your voices out there and leave those reviews. So. Thank you very much. I know I'm slightly under time, but that will give you another chance to get a secondary cup of tea. Um, and I'm also happy to take any questions or answer any comments that are going in the chat as well. Thank you so much. That was a fantastic presentation. Thank you. Yeah, it, 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 thank you. Um, it's it's good to know that like even our little comments can have a can have an impact. I'll I'll have to think twice before. Uh, no, I won't think twice, but I'll have to try to encourage myself to post uh, a bit more than uh, always. Try to stay silent when there's uh, the general public <laughs> uh, there to read my comments. I'm always very conscious of it. Um, yeah. It's, uh, you you work um you said you work in an insurance company yes uh, do you do you work in a data science there yes so I work alongside a, another girl there and we are sort of in the data and analytics space and um, within the company that's um uh, that's fantastic um I, I'd say it's, it's very good that they have some uh, somebody who is so um aware of bias and and working for them and actually yeah that's I think it's, word. I think it's something you know we all sort of go about our everyday lives and we we think oh well I'm sure something like this is is thought about when when people design these things but having more representative teams or people who have even just thought to take a moment and read up and research more actually makes makes a huge difference and it's why we see a lot of companies trying to hire more diverse people into user experience backgrounds and and user interface pieces for their products because if it's 
an entire team of everybody with the same background and same experience, then you don't get any change in your product. Yeah, um, absolutely. We, we have... We have a question there for you from uh, Susanna, if, if you wouldn't mind answering it along this line. Uh, so regarding the automotive industry, uh, how is the insurance industry handling this, knowing these biases? There you go, on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I work in the, in the healthcare uh, side of insurance, but I'll give it a go. Um, I would say that a lot of the insurance companies now are, we saw a long time ago in UK policy that even though it was actually against um, the preferential bias towards women, they've made changes to create equal standards across how they judge men and women when it comes to crashes. So um, previously, a insurance quote for a female in the UK would have been lower in price than a quote for males and it was because we knew that sadly males are in crashes more and they're more likely to drive sporty cars they're more likely to just speed a little bit over the over the <laughs> limit compared to females and therefore it was safer for those companies to insure females than it was for males which is why they kept the prices lower but then what happened was a legal change that required them to keep them all the same so I think what's happening is, in this case, the bias was towards women rather than towards men. And you can see people analysing the data in the background and handling their bias to sort of make it more equal across how claims are processed and how, what money people pay to be insured. Very good. Um... <laughs> But it's it's a, it's a bit scary now. I'm learning to drive, so I hope <laughs> I hope the insurance won't be too bad, but it will. <laughs> well, I suppose as well, and insurance varies based on age. So if you're if you're a new driver at, at 16 and 17, 18, it's going to cost a lot of money. But the closer you get to that sort of 25 age bracket, then then it's going to be okay. <laughs> Uh, very good. So can I ask a quick question? Um, I know that like med tech has been just growing exponentially over the last couple of years, especially you've got apps to track absolutely every aspect of your health in your life. And I suppose the question is like, in your experience in the, in, in, um, in the insurance industry, is there a lot of crossover? Like, are you finding that your firms are reaching out to these different med tech apps to improve your data analysis? Well, um, I work in, in claims, so I know a bit more about that. But when it comes to med tech, there's actually a bias there as well. When when Apple first released their Apple Watch and their, their fitness trackers, they included loads of things and they had copper sensors and they were they were tracking people's blood rate and their oxygen levels and how many steps they took in a day but what they didn't incorporate was menstrual tracking for females into the health app they just thought that that wasn't necessary and they also thought that um females could put phones in their pockets and we we all know that females pockets are either fake or they're too small <laughs> for a phone to fit in and if you've got a skirt with no pockets then then it can't track your steps so they went through a lot of ridicule for the fact that females couldn't even access the medical tracking that these fitness things were designed to give them um and there in some cases i do think that the medical industry and insurance um, sort of play a good part together. But there are cases where, and it would scare me if it happened, is if someone, something happens to them, God forbid, and they, they go and get their medical health care, that their insurance policy is tied to their current state of health when they took the policy out and it won't cover them anymore. Um, and I think that's going to be a lot of what research needs to go into and understanding that because especially with coronavirus, a lot of people are afraid of what's called long COVID. And there have been slight whispers and rumors that 
whether you have had COVID will affect whether you get insured, whether you can get a mortgage, whether you can get all these other factors that we just take for granted in life that you apply and your credit score is fine. But once places start taking your previous medical history and your health into account, I think that's going to be a very worrying and tricky situation to balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to get interesting. (laughs) (laughs) Thank thank you very much uh, for that, Chloe. um, Thank you. (laughs) <laughs> a lot of data, a lot of facts to take in. It's uh, very knowledgeable. It's, um, I'm going to bump you much, Invisible Scott. Women up on my reading list. I think so. I think I need to stop rereading old books and read new books. <laughs> I, I I only ever read a book once. I'm, I'm usually unable to read them twice. And I think it's a skill to read it. Kind of like I know this happened, you know. Netflix was kind of made for me, where you just watch loads of different things once, and there's something else then. But I think I think there's something about reading a book many times and actually really knowing it. And I don't know. Yeah. Uh. I don't. Know. I think I'm with Chloe on this one, especially with uh, with like all the weirdness over the last few months. There's something comforting about rereading these books and kind of getting that escapism. For a little while, I I read Animal Farm twice, and that's only because it's tiny. <laughs> <laughs> I think as well, it's for me. It's whether do I have my Kindle charged, and and will I pick it up and read something new and and pay for a new book, or will I just go to the bookshelf and pick up one that I have already bought and read twenty times? And sometimes the laziness wins, and I end up with a book that I've read plenty of times. <laughs> <laughs> well cool all right so we're gonna take a quick coffee break now uh we will be back with discussions at twelve fifteen. so enjoy a little bit of a break thank you very much chloe and thank you thank bye you so have a great day bye you too
Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Hope you all had a quite wee break. We have been having a great morning, and now we are heading towards a brilliant afternoon. So coming up, we have three brilliant sessions planned. The first one, a blueprint for debugging poor mental health in the tech industry by Nikki. Then we will try to explore the first voice driven web application by Luis. And finally, we will be understanding how to develop applications with Angular for everyone by Emma. So we have our first speaker. Hi, Nikki. How are you? Hi there. I'm good. Thank you. I, you? I'm, I'm good. I'm good. So I have always been, you know, amazed with the title of your session, <laughs> or Blueprint, because uh, I would be lying if I uh, say that I never, you know, felt myself that sometimes the pressure is catching up, especially because I'm a coder by nature. So, yep, I'm looking forward for a great session. Good. Over good. To you. Thank you very much. I'll just share my screen. Okay, so um, welcome and thank you so much for for choosing to listen to this session. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about mental health, mental well-being in the tech industry. A wee bit about me first of all. I am Nikki Graham. I'm a 42-year-old wife and mum of two kids. I'm the operations manager in GCD Technologies in Lurgan in Northern Ireland. I started out after school by doing sports studies at university because I always wanted to be a PE teacher. Um, and then I went and studied a master's in management. And I've always had an interest in both of these subjects and in particular the link between them and workplace well-being. Still enjoy my sport. I do a lot of running, I play hockey. And I started out after university as a statistician for the government in Northern Ireland. And then I moved to be an investigating officer for the Northern Ireland Ombudsman. And whilst I really love this job, I find that a combination of the daily commute to work, the constant competitive ambitions of my colleagues and the expectation that staff would work overtime at weekends really got to me. And in 2017, I had what I like to call my midlife crisis. I got burnt out. I was diagnosed with depression. And after about nine months of sick leave, I decided that I would abandon my public sector career and reevaluate life. One thing led to another. And in 2018, I joined GCD Technologies. Now, I still take medication. I have my bad days, I have my bad spells, but all in all, I have no regrets whatsoever about the changes that I made. Right now, my work-life balance is great. My workplace with great colleagues is less than 10 minutes away, and this offers me the flexibility to be all of these things that I want to be. So I guess that's why I'm doing this presentation today. I want to highlight the issue. I want to campaign for more awareness of how it can be addressed by each and every one of us. So firstly, I'm going to look at the bug. So we all have physical health and we all have mental health. And according to the World Health Organization, mental health is a state of well-being in which the individual realizes his or her own abilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. So well-being really is a balance point between an individual's resource pool and the challenges that they face. And that's relevant to physical well-being and to mental well-being. Poor mental health, simply put, is when our health is not what we would want it to be, when we just don't have that balance quite right. So looking at the bug, poor mental health is when we find it difficult to manage how we think, feel, act with respect to daily stresses. So maybe you have difficulty getting to sleep, trouble concentrating, you just don't want to get out of bed in the morning, um, you don't feel like having a chit chat at tea break time in work. It's important to remember that these feelings are widespread and that poor mental health is common and it doesn't mean that somebody's mentally ill. Having continuous episodes of poor mental health could indicate a problem, however. 
A mental illness is a diagnosable and treatable health condition, which can be severe enough to disrupt everyday life. But it's not black and white, it's a spectrum. And what we need to remember is that we all have chinks in our armour and it was great to have that chat at the start just, just to demonstrate that. We don't have to have a diagnosis of mental illness to have poor mental health. So what I want to do now is remove the stigma of craziness, insanity, of being mental and accept that this topic is relevant to everyone. What I want to do from now on is to refer to this bug as mental well-being. Let's not box it up as poor mental health and present it as a negative phenomenon that only affects a few people. Let's go with a concept that's relevant to all of us and is equally as important as physical well-being. The National Institute for Health and Care Excellence states that common mental health disorders affect an estimated one in six adults at any one time. And actually recently I've heard even one in four people. Zoning in on the workplace in the UK, the average worker takes 4.4 sick days per year. And of these sick days, 12.4%, that's 17.5 million working days are due to mental health conditions. And yep, poor mental wellbeing is probably underreported due to the stigma and the true impact of it is probably unknown. There's also the concept of presenteeism in the workplace and that's when staff don't report sick, they come into work even if they are failing poorly and they're not really properly fit for work. And then zoning in further, alarmingly, evidence suggests that the tech industry has a much higher prevalence of poor mental wellbeing, up to five times as much among staff than the UK average. There are many factors that can influence our wellbeing. Firstly, there are the psychological factors, past events such as trauma, abuse, loss, bullying, loneliness, neglect. There are biological factors such as genetics, physical health, drug and alcohol misuse, and brain chemistry. And then there are environmental factors. There's the weather, air pollution, and our working and living conditions. And next I'm going to show just a little animation from mine, the mental health charity, which hopefully will summarize what I've said so far and sort of point us in the direction of where hopefully we're going. We're Mind, the mental health charity. We're here to make sure everybody with a mental health problem has somewhere to turn for advice and support. In the past, people thought if you had a mental health problem, you would never feel better. You might meet people who still feel this. Maybe you feel this way about yourself. Mental health is just like physical health. Everybody has it and needs to look after it. You have good mental health if you're able to think, feel, and react in the ways that you need and want. You might need support with your mental health if you are finding the way you're thinking, feeling, or reacting is more difficult or even impossible to cope with. This might be because of things that are happening in your life right now. A traumatic event may affect your mental health in a big way too, even years later. We are all different. Everybody experiences a huge variety of feelings, thoughts and emotions as part of their normal life. But how and when we have them can be really different depending on who we are. Some of us can find these harder to cope with. This can be because of our upbringing and childhood, past experiences or the things happening in our lives right now. That's why it's important that only you, someone who knows you really well or someone who is qualified, gets to say when you need help. If your feelings, thoughts and reactions are getting in the way of how you want to live, if you feel things aren't right, if you feel like you need help, you can ask for it. We're not going to pretend it's easy. Mental health problems can change your life and for some they can be overwhelming. But that's why MIND is here. We're going to face it with you. We'll listen, give support and fight your corner. To find out more, visit mind.org.uk. So we've looked at the bug, we've looked at the prevalence of it, 
and the factors that influence it. And now I want to look at the impact that this bug can make firstly on the individual. And what I've listed here are some of the most frequent symptoms of the most common mental health conditions. I'm not going to read them out, but hopefully you'll get a bit of an idea from it. And this next slide is just a snippet of a very personal letter that I shared with all of my colleagues at the start of lockdown. And I realised at that time that a lot of other people were struggling and I thought that if I let them know how I felt, then they would know that they weren't alone. And in this letter, I talk a bit about my disturbed sleep, racing thoughts, physical pain, and how I wanted to withdraw socially. And actually got really good feedback and actually it started a lot of conversations in the workplace about mental health. So how does this translate to the workplace? Well, firstly, absenteeism. Increase in sickness absence will have an obvious impact on the quantity and quality of work done, and thus the bottom line and the profitability of the business, particularly when there are frequent short periods of absence. Sufferers of poor mental wellbeing also experience physical symptoms which may compound this outcome. It also affects work performance and whether that's as a result of absenteeism, a byproduct of presenteeism, there may be a reduction in productivity and output, an increase in error rates and amount of accidents, there could be poor decision making, deterioration of planning and control of work, there may also be loss of motivation and commitment, burnout, poor timekeeping and staff turnover. And it can also affect the relationships at work. Prevalence of poor mental well-being in the workplace can lead to tension and conflicts between colleagues, poor relationships with clients, and an increase in disciplinary plenary problems. So why does the tech industry have a higher prevalence than the rest of the population? While some factors can't be accounted for or prevented in the workplace, and that would be mostly the psychological and biological factors, there are a number of relevant factors. Firstly, the nature of the job. It's a well-proven fact that physical and mental well-being can impact each other and that taking measures to improve our physical well-being can also improve our mental well-being. The UK Chief Medical Officer, when he's not dealing with a pandemic, advises that for good physical and mental well-being, adults should aim to be physically active every day. They should aim to minimise the amount of time they spend being sedentary and when physically possible should break up long periods of inactivity with at least light physical activity. And here lies the problem because the tech industry by its very nature is a sedentary industry. Generally speaking the job involves long periods of sitting indoors quite often under artificial lights with poor ventilation, staring at a screen or even multiple screens. Lighting, air quality and temperature of an office can also impact on our well-being. Sick building syndrome was a phenomenon that became popular in the 1990s and it relates to well-being being affected for no apparent reason other than time spent in a particular building. And for example, serotonin, the happy hormone, it increases with sunlight and that's the reason why psychiatrists recommend that depressed patients go out in the sun for 30 minutes per day. Numerous studies have also shown that poor air quality reduces worker productivity. So it's crucial that today's businesses focus on creating healthy buildings. More often than not, work in the tech industry is done in isolation. And research has found that 64% of lone workers face psychological distress, which is significantly higher than employees working alongside colleagues. And this is all really relevant at the minute during this pandemic. Who's missed the laughter, the camaraderie, the support, the banter with your colleagues? How can employers ensure healthy buildings when staff are working remotely as well? Another area that I want to look at is the nature of the workforce. The demographics of the tech industry is skewed, skewed towards younger male workers. Millennials, who are usually thought of those born after 1984, make up a large proportion of the tech industry and much has been written about them. Simon Sinek, who is an author and a TED speaker, he did an interesting talk about millennials. 
He stressed that through no fault of their own, millennials have the trait that if something isn't great, they move on rather than address the unhappiness. He talked about how millennials are accustomed to instant gratification at the push of a button. So, for example, box sets, next day delivery, on demand services, swiping right to show interest. Millennials are also known for having been exposed to increased parental protection during education years and for a focus on participation rather than winning. For example, the losers getting medals in sports day. And frankly, this isn't a reality in the workplace. Sinek has said that this entire generation is more likely to have low self-esteem through no fault of their own. In addition, people who spend more time on social media, more likely the younger generations, have higher rates of depression than those who spend lower amounts of time. They quite often get a hit for how many likes, shares, retweets that they've generated with a social media post, rather than through the satisfaction of of working at something over a period of time and being able to look back at the progress that has been made. This instant hit releases dopamine in the body, which is known as the feel-good neurotransmitter. And rather like alcohol and drugs do, um, although like with these substances, it's maybe okay in measured amounts, but excessive amounts can be very dangerous. There's also a gender imbalance in the tech industry. Approximately 84% of the tech workforce is male. And while mental well-being difficulties can affect anyone regardless of demographics, studies have shown that certain mental illnesses affect men and women differently. And perhaps most interesting and worrying finding is that while on average more women are diagnosed with common mental illnesses than men, the rate of male suicide is significantly higher. This suggests that men are suffering with mental distress, but may not be receiving or indeed asking for the help that they need. And this was highlighted recently in a BBC documentary by Freddie Flintoff about eating disorders. And finally, the nature of the tech industry. You've probably heard about the digital revolution. The UK tech industry is a high growth fast-paced industry which grew six times faster than any other industry in the UK economy in 2018 and has been described as being right in the driving seat for the future. The industry has a reputation of being always on. Bugs, crashes, hacks, they can happen any time of the day or night and work is quite often managed in sprints and businesses that build by time, well naturally they want to squeeze as much out of their staff as possible. Our work emails and documents are available on our own personal phones and all of this means that it's getting harder and harder to separate our work and private lives. So how do we fix this problem? Well a recent study reported that three quarters of employees don't think that the workplace offers enough mental well-being support and this needs to change. Addressing mental well-being is a crucial issue. It affects individuals in their personal lives as well as at work. And that's why the World Health Organization has dedicated a day as World Mental Health Day, which I'm sure you know was recently enough on the 10th of October. Employers have a, have a duty to care to all staff. When you're in the workplace, you'll see signs for where the fire exits are, who the first aider is, and you'll know where to find a bandage or a plaster. And all of these are provisions that are put in place in case they're going to be needed. But what provisions are made for, for mental well-being? We need to be proactive about it as well. Organisations also need to understand that mental wellness is multifaceted. There is no hot fix. You won't roll out a programme and see the benefits in 30 days. So it's a really hard sell. But failure to see mental well-being as a priority is risky. But what organisations have it listed on their risk register? They might have accounted for the building burning to the ground or a major power outage. But the more likely scenario is that their staff may be absent or under power due to poor mental well-being. And this has been brushed under the carpet. Furthermore, if a member of staff has a physical disability or injury, Reasonable adjustments are immediately made. Can this be said of those who are experiencing poor mental well-being? 
So whose job is it to fix this? Well, I reckon it's a top-down, bottom-up approach that should be tackled from the inside out and the outside in. So starting at the top, mental well-being needs to be brought out of the shadows and into the spotlight of the boardroom so that executives can ensure that their employees have access to the resources and support that they need to be able to make the balance that we've talked about. Companies need to put in place their own policies and training to support employees as well as raise awareness of mental well-being. And Simon Sinek in a separate talk about empathy stated that the real job of a leader is not to be in charge, but to take care of those in our charge. Generally, organisations do not, however, have a director of wellness. So we need stakeholders. We need internal champions. We need subject matter experts. However, ultimately, we shouldn't leave well-being up to other people. Personal maintenance is also vital, especially given that mental well-being is subjective and a myriad of factors can influence it. So really, in essence, we're all in this together, each and every one of us. The NHS su suggests that there are five steps to mental well-being. So what I want to do now is I want to look at how these five steps can be used to write good code for looking after mental well-being in our workplaces. There's no out-of-the-box solution, no sheep dip approach, but these are some wireframes to get things started and to grow our resource pools. So I have six suggestions. The first su suggestion is that we need to be aware. We need to educate ourselves, educate our staff, educate our management, educate each other. We need to know our own status. We need to share our stories. We need to bring in experts, do our research and have discussions. Ignorance is definitely not bliss in this instance. Everyone needs empathy and perspective. And the only way that we can gain perspective is to be aware. I read an article recently about a mum and daughter in Northern Ireland who created a gymware brand to raise money for mental health charities. And I was really struck by a quote in it which said, check on your friends and family and just have open conversations about how everyone is doing mentally. Sometimes the biggest of smiles can hide the most pain. So to have empathy, we need people to be open. And that's the next suggestion. It's imperative that we talk to each other, but also that we listen. We need to know the verbal and non-verbal cues that people give when they're not tip top. And we must break down any barriers or stigmas to this. So now I'm going to talk about my broken toe, for example. At the start of lockdown, I fell out of a bin. Yes, I fell out of a bin and I broke my toe. And I was really, really proud of it. And I was showing people pictures on a daily basis of the various shapes, sizes and colours that my toe was turning. But when it came to my own diagnosis of depression, I didn't open up to my colleagues with that letter that I read from earlier until I was in the job 17 months. But we need an equal playing field between physical and mental well-being. So we all need to be brave and talk about it. A friend of mine recently lost a family member to suicide. He was a well-known local radio presenter. And this guy's family have been campaigning ever since. And in a recent social media post by her, she wrote that people know it's OK to not be OK. But do they know that it's OK to actually talk about it? And we need to normalise these conversations. Thirdly, we need to be active. I've already mentioned that physical activity can help support mental well-being. So let's encourage each other in the workplace to do this. Let's have lunchtime walks, daily step competitions after work, yoga, five aside, or just simply a daily stretching ritual. It doesn't have to be rigorous. It doesn't have to be onerous. It doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to cost anything. But we need to keep moving to keep well. And quite often, people feel safety in numbers whenever they're exercising. And it's also easier once a habit is formed or when everyone else is doing it. 
we need to be nourished. Firstly, we need to nourish our body. And in the workplace, it can be very easy to snack on unhealthy products, skip meals, overdo the caffeinated drinks. But if the workplaces have tasty, healthy alternatives available, then perhaps we can change our habits. We can also encourage each other with this. We also need to nourish our brains and keep our minds active and learn new skills. And these all add to an overall sense of well-being. And finally, you need to make sure you get enough kip because sleep really does make a world of difference. My fifth suggestion is to be flexible. We need to listen to individual needs and understand their backstories. A one size approach to promote wellness will not fit all and a rigid policy will not address the needs of everyone or indeed anyone. We also need to be flexible in our approach to ourselves and others and we need to do what we can to understand and make sure that everyone has a good work life balance. And actually, I was listening to a podcast recently that suggested that work-life balance can actually be quite a misleading or controversial term because isn't work part of life? So really, we shouldn't have to have a balance. We need to make sure that we come to work feeling well, but also that we go home feeling well. Finally, we need to be kind. We should be kind to each other inside and outside of the organisation. Social connectedness is known to improve mental well-being for all involved. Let's understand ourselves and understand each other and forget the how was your weekend chit chat and dig a little deeper. After all, there are few people in the world that you will spend as much time with as your colleagues. The average person spends one quarter of their adult working life or three and a half thousand days in work. Let's also stretch that kindness beyond the office walls. Why don't we volunteer, give, help, support? Let's make sure that everyone has the opportunity to do these things. And for example, the foundation that was set up in memory of that local radio presenter who I was talking about, they're now promoting a random act of kindness week in December. Why don't we give this a go? Or why, why do we have to wait until December? But overall, Let's embed all of these actions and make them part of the culture and the back end of our businesses. We need to make sure that corporate environments provide everyone with the tools that they need to strike the right balance for mental well-being. It shouldn't be something that we need to plan and timetable. It should be part of who we are and what we do. We need to move to society where all of us become aware of our own mental well-being when it fluctuates and other people's as well. And we need to learn how to cope with our own and other people's me mental well-being. It's all of our responsibilities to make this change. And this is our call to action. For anyone who wants or needs further information, I've listed a few suggestions here. The NHS website is always a really reliable go-to for any health and well-being related information. I've also listed a number of awareness and support organisations, some local to Northern Ireland, some national, um, which you might be interested in for yourself, your colleagues, your friends, your family, your organisation. And there's also a link to the article that I talked about um, where the mother and daughter started up their own gym, gym wear brand. And these are a few resources that I have found really helpful. In Kelly Holmes's podcast series, she interviews a number of celebrities who suffer from poor mental well-being. And I find a number of these really very eloquently describe their conditions and how they cope with them. And I also bought myself a good old fashioned book, Mental Health and Wellbeing in the Workplace. And this has a really useful section in it that has a brief description of some of the more common mental health conditions for those of us who aren't as familiar with some of them. And it points you to what signs to look out for and suggests how you should behave when you encounter them. And there's also a full chapter at the end of it on supporting staff experiencing mental health problems. And finally, Jog On by Bella Mackey. It's another honest and actually quite funny read where she describes how she unwittingly used running to manage her crippling anxiety and depression. 
So finally, I just want to say thank you so much for your interest in the subject matter. It really does mean a lot to me and thank you so much for listening and please do take care. Hey, thanks, Nikki. That was a lovely session. I I could relate with every point that you brought up in the session. And, uh, you know, it, it really is going to help me a lot because personally, I have felt that us to quit sometimes in life, uh, especially the work. And uh, but now, you know, during the lockdown, I, I felt that, OK, you know, I should be active. I should be talking to my family. I should be giving time and really opening up. And it really helped me a lot. So that was a that was a brilliant session, and uh, I'm sure all of the people who are hearing us, they will be taking something out of it, and they will be implementing that in their lives. That was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much for this lovely topic. Thank you. Okay, people. So we have another brilliant topic coming up: building your own first voice-driven web application by Louise. Hi, Luis. How are you? Hey there. How is it going? It's going good. It's nice to have you here. Yeah, thank you very much. Happy to be here. Yeah, sure. So it's over to you for your topic. Yes, of course. Well, hi there. It is 7.45 here uh, AM, and I am really excited to be part of this DevFest and of course, being part of uh, the awesome GDG UK and Ireland communities. Today, I'm going to speak about how you can build your first voice-driven web application. So let's get started. Imagine you can speak to your web application for a while. Let's say you don't need to use your keyboard or even your mouse. Your app is re ready to listen to voice comments and perform actions for you. How cool is that? Just think for a while, what kind of application would you like to build using these features? Please share your idea in the comment section now. You'll have 10 seconds to do it. Are you ready? Again, please share your ideal web application that can respond to voice comments. 10 seconds are running now. Few seconds left. Great, the time is over. I hope you are sharing some ideas there. Uh, the time has ended and it is time to introduce myself. My name is Luis Aviles and I consider myself as an open source enthusiast. I love all things web, JavaScript, and TypeScript. I usually speak at tech events, meetups, I write some technical articles and I author some courses about web development using Angular and also TypeScript in Spanish. I'm the founder of the Angular Bolivia community and the NG Bolivia conference. I've been recognized as a Google developer expert in web technologies and Angular two years ago. And this is the agenda for today. We'll start talking about the web APIs. Uh, next, we'll be talking about Web Speech API, uh, the speech synthesis. Uh, we'll be showing a demo, a live demo, of course, and we'll be looking uh, at the source code. So what are the Web APIs? Um, API stands for Application Programming Interface. What does that mean? According to MDN, which is the Mozilla Developer Network, APIs are constructs made available in different programming languages. You can use any language, any programming language you know to develop or create a complex functionality more easily. If that is uh, confusing still, let's think in, in an example to understand it better. Let's suppose you really like taking pictures and you post them in social media, right? You just got a new camera. You don't have too, too much knowledge about how the camera works internally. The good news is that nowadays, you only need to press buttons to turn on and turn off, or take a picture, or even start recording a video. 
As you may understand, we are talking about a device that has a complex circuit that involves sensors, involves different lenses, right? Uh, power management and other details. The good news is that you don't need to learn all about this or manage the circuit itself. That's how APIs provide a way to create complex applications without having to implement the details or know the complex part. In modern web development, we usually use client-side JavaScript. We have modern frameworks like Angular and other options today, libraries based in JavaScript and TypeScript, and there are a lot of APIs available today. However, most of these APIs are not part of the JavaScript programming language. We can mention two categories for them. Browser APIs and the third-party APIs. What does that mean? Talking in terms of browser APIs, these are available into your favorite browser. You can fetch data from the server, for example, using the fetch API. You don't need to import any library or install a package because the fetch API is implemented in your browser. We can manage or process audio in, in browser through the web audio API. In the same way, you can um, implement an application based on video or even drawing graphics in the browser. Device APIs create client solutions uh, that allow interacting with device hardware or application. If you are thinking to build an application that does that, then you can use device APIs. For example, manage your camera or your microphone or even the native message application. If you're thinking to impair this data for long-term storage in the browser, then you can use maybe the client-side storage APIs. Again, you can perform any of these actions into your browser without having to install any additional package. Third-party APIs. On the other hand, the third-party APIs, as you may guess, are not built into the web browser, and maybe you'll need to install uh, an additional package for your application. We can mention the Maps API, for example, the Google Maps one, or the GitHub REST API that provides a, a set of endpoints to create calls and get data about repositories, GitHub users, and more. If you want to implement an application that can show you the, the tweets. For example, you can use the Twitter API that provides several tools to contribute or analyze uh, your tweets. If you are thinking about payment processing, you can use the PayPal SDK, PayPal, uh, PayPal APIs. Or even if you are planning to build your own client um, of, of messaging, you can use the Telegram APIs. Of course, the, all these uh, SDKs or libraries are free to use. What about web speech API then? As the image shows, it generates a speech to text output. And that means it uses a speech recognition as an input. In technical words, the speech recognition is available through the speech recognition interface that we can see uh, below. And you'll need to create an object from it it will depend on the, the browser you are using at that time to create the appropriate object. And then you'll need to call the start method in order to uh, start uh, listening to the voice comments from your user. You can create an um, object, uh, again, from it, and your application will be ready to listen. It is time to talk about the web speech synthesis now. What about uh, web speech synthesis? In simple words, it can uh, generate text from a speech output. The speech synthesis works in a similar way to the web speech API because it is available again on the speech uh, synthesis interface. Once you have this object ready in your application, it is ready to read any text you provide and produce different voice types that can be uh, configured too. 
you can review the documentation about the uh, speech synthesis to find out what kind of configurations you can use in your web application. Now we are ready to see the demo. So I have uh, implemented an Angular application that, that I would like to show you now. So let me share, let me change my screen. And looks like I'll need to reshare my screen because I like you can listen the responses from my web application. And that means you are going to listen what our web application is saying in real time. Let me look to the screen. Here it is. Okay. Then we are ready. So this is a basic UI. It is not very complex to, to understand. Um, so as you can see here, we have um, a side map where you can find more information about the, the application implementation. Uh, I have the source code available, a blog post with all the details to build an application like this from scratch, step by step. And also you can find some help here on the upper right, upper right side, where you will find more information about the available actions. For, for example, you can use English or Spanish to perform different actions inside this uh, web application. For example, you can perform a change theme, you can perform a change title or implement your own custom action here. Let's take a look. And as you can see here, there is a drop down where you can select the, the language you're going to speak. Again, it supports English or Spanish at this time. And then you'll find um, a main button here where you can press. And then the browser is going to ask for your microphone permission. And that means before you start listening to your, using, to, to your user, you'll need to enable a microphone permission for, for the browser. If you decide to close this pop-up, then you are going to see an error message like this. Let me verify, okay, yes. And in that case, you are not able to listen uh, to your user. Again, you'll need to make sure that the microphone permission is enabled for your browser. Let's try again. I'm going to perform a refresh here. Uh, press the button, and this time I'm going to allow this permission. Once I press allow, the application will be ready to listen to your voice commands. Let's see how it is working now. Hi there. This is a short demo about how you can use the Web Speech API to build powerful web applications. We are going to use some voice commands to perform actions inside this application. So let's get started. Perform change theme. Deep purple. Pink. Indigo. Finish change theme. As you can see, the application is uh, still able to show you the interim results about what you are talking in real time. And that is the demo. We are going to stop this action and let's continue with the presentation. Let me to reshare again my screen. That was the demo. Of course, uh, these slides, um, I, I added a video where you can see like a replay of this demo. It is published on YouTube. I'm going to share all these resources after this talk. As I said before, the application 
has been implemented using the Angular framework. And the question is, why Angular? There are uh, many reasons uh, to use Angular today. It has a very good tooling support. I mean, you can use, for example, a, a, the Angular CLI to create a project from scratch. You can use um, a several set of schematics available as, a, as open source projects to perform changes into your project structure. For example, you can find schematics to add the Angular material library with, with a single command and have it ready to use the Angular material components, like this application. You can use uh, the modules, modules sorry, and the lazy loading feature, of course, uh, to improve the good performance in your web, web application. You can still use TypeScript and the latest features inside JavaScript for a very good developer experience and you can make use of the strict type checking in the latest version of the Angular framework. You can use of the fast change detection and you can use or customize the, the change detection strategy inside Angular for a better performance again. And you can make use of uh, reactive programming and use RxJS for powerful reactive web applications like this project. You, of course, Angular provides a long-term support and you can count with the awesome community all around the world. I'm going to show you some lines of code to understand how the application was implemented. The first lines of code the, is about um, modeling the errors, events, and the notifications, as, as you can see here. Um, I define it a section where the uh, languages are supported. Uh, it supports the uh, English and Spanish for USA. And after that, I define it a TypeScript enum that defines the string keys that match with errors that uh, are produced by the speech recognition object. And of course, you can see what what other errors are defined into the web speech API specification. I define it also um, another TypeScript enum for the events supported by the application um, while your user is speaking in order to have a better understanding what kind of event we are listening to. Finally, I have an interface to define the um, the type of objects for all the notifications available inside the application. And as you can see, this uh, speech notification supports a custom type with a generic T in order to, for example, notify a custom object and a string, a number, for example. Here we have the speech recognizer as an Angular service. And as I mentioned before, we'll need to make use the uh, speech recognizer, or I mean, a speech recognition interface, which is available uh, again into the web speech API specification. And before starting to use this API, you'll need to make sure uh, the, the this object web is web uh, speech recognition is available into your browser. Otherwise, you can show an error message or can show a pop-up like saying you need to update your browser or provide a better alternative. In case uh, it is supported by your browser, we can use um, a, an object creation and it will depend on the browser you are using. For example, in Google Chrome, you'll need to use this constructor, which is the WebKit speech recognition. This constructor will create an object that is ready for voice recognition. And after that, you can provide a set of configuration parameters for this object and provide the desired behavior for your web application. In the same Angular service, we can provide um, some wrapper functions. Of course, there are a lot of ways to implement a service in, in this part. And what I did here 
is provide some function wrappers in order to provide a, a, a reactive programming for the implementation. And that means every function I define it inside the Angular service will emit a notification as an observable. That means it creates um, um, an observable object as a wrapper for the recognition dot on start uh, function uh, or event this time in this example. Once that event is triggered by the API, this function will emit an start notification without any data. And that's why I am using never in the uh, function signature here. In the same way, we can implement a function to be ready to listen, for example, the stop or the, uh, or the canceling action inside the uh, web speech API actions. And this time I'm, I'm showing you how the uh, results are, are cached inside the service uh, implementation. In this case, uh, this function again is going to return or emit an object wrapped inside an observable object. Um, this time, as you can see, it is um, setting the type of the data as a string. So that means we are going to emit in real time the different messages that we are going to get from the API. And in the final section, once we are ready to listen for the final message or the final inferred message by the API, we are going to emit a final result. And this contains uh, a string which will be displayed in this screen in real time as you saw in the demo. On the Angular component side, you'll need to uh, define uh, some attributes there. And I am using the, the dependency injection from the Angular framework in order to have ready an instance of the previous service. And in order to provide, uh, again, a reactive programming implementation, we are not we are not going to subscribe to the observables we define it into the service. Instead of that, I'm going to create some observables as uh, attributes inside this component. Again, into the web speech component, which is again an Angular component, we'll be ready to uh, listen to the uh, emitted values. The in each recognition function, we'll uh, assign the observable result from the to the transcript attribute. And also, we can apply some RxJS operators there. As you can see, I am using the uh, operator pipe, which is a function. And after that, I am using the tab and map. Um, what I mean is operators are functions inside RxJS. Um, this tab and map functions are pipeable operators. And that means they can take an observable as an input and return another observable as an output or as a result. The listening attribute, on other hand, gets the result of a creation operator, which is part from RxJS. And what is a creation operator? Actually, it is another function that can create a new observable. And in this case, I'm using merge function, which creates a new observable, which is able to emit any value or result from the input observables. And all, all, the, all the parameters that receive this merge object, again, are observ observables and we are going to have a single one from this input. Um, in this case, the listening attribute is going to emit a, a Boolean value, a true, for example, if the speech recognition service is running. It's going to emit false otherwise. Finally, on the, uh, in the template side, we can use the async uh, pipe to listen and process the emitted values. 
again, into this uh, implementation, we are not using the subscribe function. And for having a cleaner implementation, um, here I am using the uh, async pipe. And in this first case, if the listening is true, uh, we're going to display uh, a sound wave animation as you saw in, in the demo, and we'll stop the voice recognition uh, functionality for a click event. Otherwise, it, it will display the mic and it is ready to start the service, uh, or I mean the voice recognition action. In the second case, um, we when the transcript uh, attribute emits a new value, uh, that string will be displayed on the string in real time with the interim results. And finally, we have an, an overview for the application implementation in terms of a class diagram. As you can see in, in this figure, the web speech component injects the service to be enabled for voice recognition. And the same happens for the uh, speech synthesis service. On the other hand, uh, a strategy pattern is applied in order to define custom actions for every voice comment supported by the application, such as change theme uh, or change the application title, or if you want to add any other uh, custom action for your application, you can do it through this pattern. Here are some resources about this talk. Uh, you can find the demo project online in the first link on my website. And also I, I wrote a complete blog post a couple of weeks ago about how you can build this application from scratch, step by step, using Angular CLI, using Angular Material, RxJS, and TypeScript. Do not miss this article. I think you can find it useful. And the source code is uh, available on GitHub. It is uh, open source and ready for you. Um, you can give it a star and fork to play it around. And of course, feel free to send any pull requests for adding a new language support, for example, or any other new feature to this project. You can follow me or find me uh, on Twitter, GitHub, LinkedIn, or any other social network as Luis Aviles. I hope you enjoyed this talk. Thank you very much. Thanks, Luis. That was a really great session. And I never knew we could uh, have this powerful technol technology to build up such beautiful solutions. It, it unleashes and takes the technology to the next level. Thanks for that. Uh, demonstration. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it really much. Okay, uh, coming up, we have Emma from Google, and she will be walking us through how to build an application and make it available for everybody. Hi, Emma. Hi. Can you hear me? How are you? Oh, yeah. Yep, I oh. can. Hi. Great. I'm good. How are you? Yeah, not so bad. It's It's been an exciting day. Yeah, I really loved that last talk. I just read that article, so it was cool to see it presented. Yeah. OK, it's on, over to you now. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, so we are here to talk about building for everyone with Angular. Uh, my name is Emma Tversky. I am a developer relations engineer at Google, specifically focused on Angular. Um, and I really love to focus on all things usability, all things visual, um, outside of work, I really love art and design. So that sort of fits into what I do during the day as well. Um, and today we're gonna talk about more specifically accessibility in Angular. And because we typically call accessibility ally or A11Y, I thought it'd be fun to sort of title this um, 11 ways to make your Angular app more accessible. So we're going to talk about 11 things that I think are really important to bring in when we're thinking about building Angular applications um, with accessibility in mind. So without further ado, let's get started. Uh, so number one, I'm playing off of the, the number one quite a bit, but start from day one. 
I think this is maybe the most intuitive, but also the hardest to get everybody on board with. Um, and it's, it's important to think about this in the context of the fact that 1 billion people in this world have a need for accessibility. Uh, so thinking inclusively and incorporating accessibility from the start is a really great way to make sure that it is a top priority. We always don't know what we don't know. And so it's always important to come to the development table, the design table, whatever table you're at with an open mind uh, and make sure that you're listening for all the answers and coming in with the positive intention, right? Um, there's all kinds of different disabilities we're trying to think of. We're thinking of physical, cognitive, auditory, visual, uh, speech, but we're also thinking about things that are temporary disabilities, right? So maybe if I broke my arm, I would be temporarily only able to type with one hand. How does that change my user interaction? Or maybe something even more simple is if you're a primary caregiver and you maybe have a child in a hand, you're also only using one hand. So there's all kinds of different things. And even beyond that, we can think about the fact that usability never hurts anyone, right? So making sure that your Angular app is accessible means that all people can use it in all use cases. So some really great things have come out of accessibility initiatives like uh, you know, autocomplete in search was initially to help users type less um, as an initiative started by accessibility. But I'm pretty sure we've all utilized autocomplete in some sense if we're texting our friends and we don't want to type long words or we want to make sure things are spelled right. So again, these, these initiatives can start out small but have a major impact on all people to, uh, regardless of their definition there. So that said, I want to introduce the app I'm going to be talking about today. So I have a bunch of screenshots of this app. I'm just calling my project toast. Uh, and this website's pretty intuitive. It, it makes toast. So we have a bunch of different controls in three panels on the bottom, and it allows us to navigate, uh, to click one of our many toast buttons, to select the type of bread, the slicing of our bread, if it's buttered, how toasted it is, what toppings we're putting on it, if it's some trendy avocado toast. So we're just going to be talking about all of the other things we want to make changes to our applications in the context of this demo app I built. So number two is going to be use Angular Material. So Luis actually uh, used Angular Material in his last talk, and that was a really great use case, right? Um, so Angular Material is a library maintained by Google uh, that follows the Google material design specs um, and brings in the material design system to Angular. So it's a set of components um, as well as schematics and a CDK that supports them um, to build out usability. And the idea is to provide reusable UI components out of the box. Now, the reason I'm saying that this is a great way to introduce accessibility in your application is that these components out of the box are accessible. So if you're building something that's really cool, that's like this really awesome voice-driven app, but maybe you just want to make sure it's usable and you're not focused on making it this branded custom design system, um, using Angular Material is a really great way to make sure that you're not having to focus all of your efforts on redefining what accessibility, accessibility looks like on the web. You're just getting that out of the box because you're using these built-in first-party features. Um, so it's this really great idea of, right, we always want to talk about not reinventing the wheel. That's a great example of how to do it. Um, and it solves a lot of com common issues. So here, all of the components I have on my page are Angular Material components because I knew out of the box I wanted accessibility. And I didn't want to have to worry too much about that when I was making my toast. I was more interested in the toast. The next one is quite... Uh, in parallel, and this is use the CDK's ally package. So in Angular, we have an import that you can add to any of your projects called Angular CDK Ally. And this is within the component development kit or the CDK, uh, and ally being again, access accessibility. And so this allows you to use some specific tools brought to you for Angular to specify some of the accessibility features we'll talk about in the future. Um, so things like focus trap, so uh, the ability to define um, maybe if you're building a custom modal or dialogue that you want to focus or trap focus within that dialogue when it pops up. Um, things like live announcers that allow you to announce when notifications pop up. Um, ARIA focus monitor, so all kinds of things that are going to help you sort of customize any components that you've built 
for accessibility are all going to live in this package. So here um, we've imported that package and we're going to be able to use it to accomplish some of the future goals we're talking about. Uh, number four is not always paired with accessibility, but I think when we're talking about building for everyone, a really important thing is to localize your application, right? So localize with internationalization or I18N, which is just the I, the 18 letters in the middle and the N of internationalization because it's a tongue twister. Um, and this is the idea of making sure that your application is translated into different locales and languages for a global audience, right? So if we're serving our application and we want it to be built for everyone, language is a really important part of that story. If we're thinking about cognitive impairments, we can also think about the fact that there's many people who may be trying to navigate the web in a second language. So if you're able to localize your application, you're able to serve it better and serve the information and content you have better um, for all people. So this is gonna be really simple. You're going to, uh, Angular has a great first party solution that has many recent uh, improvements that have been brought to it in its pipeline to make it much faster. Um, it's all compile time, so it's not going to provide any server or uh, any runtime additional cost so it's really optimized for performance which means that if you're serving your locate your if you're serving your project to maybe someone with poor wi-fi connection that is part of like a next billion user group that you're not providing any runtime cost for them so it's really optimized for people that maybe have low wi-fi or situations like that um so here you can see that i've localized my application into german since that is the language I took in college. Um, also, toast is still toast in German, so I thought that was fun. Um, but if you're interested more in this, we recently released a blog post on angular.io that can walk you through it a little bit more. Um, there's some great guides out there. And if you Google me, I also have a few talks on it. So if you're interested in diving more into localization, there's some great ways to get started there. Now, halfway through, uh, we're going to switch over to some things that you can actually do in your Angular templates uh, that are specific to the Angular way of development that can help make sure that you're bringing accessibility to the front and foremost uh, thought when you're developing. So Angular applications are single page applications or SPAs, and that's a really great uh, decision in sort of how web frameworks are built. But there is an issue or there is a potential problem with accessibility when it comes to page titles, right? So single page applications frequently just have one page title. Here we have our toast application. But if I wanted to navigate to a different page within the same application and it's still being a single page application, I want to make sure that I'm handling the page title appropriately, right? So typically in accessibility, if we navigate to a new page, even within the same application, we're setting the focus to the top left again to that page title to help notify the user of where they're at. So if I were to navigate to, let's say, like an about page on this same application, I would want to make sure that I indicate that change to the user so that they understand that there's a different context or a different page being uh, loaded and some information and context about what's going to be contained on that page, right? So with single page applications, making sure that you're managing the title and that you are actually changing it when you're navigating to a new internal site um, is really important. So a great way to do this is to use a title service um, and just to make sure that you, when you're thinking about design that just because a single it's a single page application doesn't mean it's a single title application. So revisiting applications, this is a great way to just make sure that you're at least notifying the user that they're on a different page so that if I navigate to 10 different pages within the same site, I'm not just seeing toast, 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 because that really doesn't give me any initial context. Um, and also make sure that you're thinking about the fact that single page applications don't always reload when they navigate to a new page. So how are you making sure that you're incorporating that page title into that um, navigation experience? Moving forward in navigation, uh, we also want to make sure that we're handling keyboard navigation. So keyboard navigation is when a uh, user of an application is using the keyboard to navigate versus maybe something like a mouse or switch or uh, voice as we saw previously. So we wanna make sure that in keyboard navigation when you're using, when a user is using a screen reader um, that we're able to navigate fully through the page in a meaningful and uh, natural content flow. 
so that they're having the same experience that um, somebody that was visually sighted may be able to. Um, and so a great sort of place to start here is with your HTML. So we'll talk a little bit more about HTML on the next slide, but making sure that you're really thinking about how your HTML is structured, that you're using, um, uh, that you're optimizing interactions and that you're using HTML properties that allow for keyboard navigation to be meaningful. This is also where the CDK comes into play and you can use that ally package to define um, navigation order. If let's say you have a custom pop-up that like, let's say here, if I opened this, I would want to be able to navigate to my controls in my application before we see my toast, right? Because when the page is loaded, there's no toast on the page. I don't wanna go to the toast box. I want the user to understand that there's these controls first before navigating up. So if we're defining any sort of uh, specific navigation order or things like that, that would be a great place to start. And like I said, uh, semantic HTML is also really important. So number seven is use semantic HTML. Now, semantic HTML is quite literally HTML that um, has meaningful uh, purpose. I, that's basically what semantic means, right? And so these are going to be tags like nav, aside, field set, section is going to be a really popular one, um, and your headers and footers, right? And so these are things that are built into accessibility services when applications are served through screen readers or switches or things like that, that have meaningful purpose to those screen readers and provide additional context so that they are knowledgeable about the fact that like a, with a button tag, right, we know that that button is going to be clickable. And so we know that we have a certain role and certain states that that button can be in like disabled. And those are gonna really help our screen reader have a meaningful purpose, right? So in the example here, I have sections. So all of the, uh, we've switched the code, but all of the sections in my HTML are going to represent different um, portions, which means when I'm actually navigating through this application, my Toast application with the screen reader, it's able to read the change in these sections and understand the navigation order by section. So just bringing some of the additional um, abilities of a screen reader in with this in mind. Um, so why this is important in Angular specifically is that in Angular, it's really easy to use custom binding to put a click event on anything, right? Um, it's really easy to model divs or custom components um, off of HTML that has no uh, in intrinsic meaning that's not semantic, right? So we can add a div and make it look like a button, but is that really going to be the most accessible option or can we use the button which already has a built-in accessibility feature and extend off of it to make sure that it's going to read the same way that all other buttons would, right? So in um, quite a few accessibility services, there's uh, this concept of being able to um, navigate the, the page by uh, element type. And so we want to make sure that if we're going through and just scanning through for buttons or clickable events or links or something like that, that that's being read. So if you're putting all of your links in spans versus anchor tags, they're not going to show up there. And that's going to be a really confusing experience. So again, just making sure that you think about things like especially form controls or um, associative labels, things that can add, uh, things that come into HTML out of the box that add meaning. Um, now, uh, the big one here is just don't use a bunch of divs. Just don't make an entire HTML, uh, component out of divs. Or if you're doing that, really think about going back with that accessibility service and essentially adding all of the things that a normal semantic HTML attribute would have, uh, into your div if it really needs to be a div. Um, so yeah. That's semantic HTML. Uh, the next one we've already sort of touched on, but I want to dive a little deeper into is to manage focus, right? So we talked about being able to navigate with a keyboard from top left to bottom right, or um, it could be different based on the locale you're in, again, with the localization. But we want to make sure that we're managing focus as we navigate. So one of the most common things in Angular applications is this issue of focus management, which is why there's a bunch of CDK tools specifically focused on this. And this is partially due to the fact that Angular has this really awesome thing of asynchronous lazy loading of content, right? So in the concert, er, with this asynchronous content, we may have already navigated past 
content that's still loading, right? Or we may have already navigated to the bottom and then something has changed based on this asynchronous concept, right? And that's really great because we love lazy loading. We love optimizations for performance, but we wanna make sure that anytime we're optimizing, especially with lazy loading in mind, that we're also thinking about focus. So if I have already navigated past content that is still loading, how am I notified when it does load? How do I? How am I notified when something changes, right? We think about this a lot with alerts or notifications, but we also have to think about it in the concept of specifically Angular's lazy loading. Um, and so a really great way to do this is to notify that some sort of different content has loaded and not change focus order, right? So we don't ever want to like, jump a user out of context, which is a very typical sort of pattern. So let's say like I'm down at the bottom and I'm picking a topping and I'm picking my avocado to put on my toast, but then a new piece of toast loads um, that was taking a little bit of time to render. I don't want to jump back up to that toast because I have no clue what just happened, right? If I'm not able to visually see any indication of that change, it's very confusing to context switch or remove context from focus. So there's a few different things in the CDK that allow this. I already talked about focus managers and focus trap, but those are gonna be ways that you can sort of define what happens with focus. Um, another thing I wanna talk about is to not autofocus and also to avoid using outline none as a CSS property. So outline none is removing the outline from a potential element. The problem here is, as you can see, as I'm navigating in my GIF through this application, um, the way that we indicate the keyboard's navigation and focus is with an outline. And so that can sometimes interact with screen readers and uh, cause the focus to not be visible on that element. So you really wanna make sure that you're searching your applications for uses of outline and thinking about how that impacts any sort of accessibility service that a user might be using and test that heavily specifically as a potential edge use case. Um, and some of these are more related to web accessibility as a whole, uh, but again, specifically with lazy loading, definitely think about focus. Um, We've talked about notifications a lot, but I wanna call out specifically number nine is think about live regions and alerts, right? So with notifications, there's two ways to handle. Um, you can either move the, uh, move the focus to that notification or that new content, or you can read it as a live region or an alert. Um, the preference is typically to not use focus and not change focus unless it's a meaningful and large change, but instead to read it. So again, if that content is loaded, that I'm reading something like content has loaded, something quick, something directive, and something that sort of fits into this property. Um, we can do this with polite uh, announcements. We can do this with immediate announcements. This is a really important thing if we're thinking about errors on forms for example, so making sure that we're notifying users of any sort of non-visible change or non-focused change, especially if it has to do with sort of like, for example, with uh, forms and errors, let's say I'm trying to submit my toast form and I'm clicking toast and I'm getting an error that uh, I haven't selected a type of bread, it could be really uh it's a really frustrating experience for someone to continue to click toast, toast, toast and not know what's happening and not get any sort of notification that there's an error or a change in some other part of the screen. So using live regions and alerts to notify users of changes. So live regions are a great segue into ARIA as a whole. Um, in that last slide, you would be using an ARIA live region, but there's more than just live regions in ARIA, right? And so ARIA is assistive rich internet applications. And this basically means giving additional content, going back to our semantic or non-semantic HTML and adding additional attributes. So here we're gonna uh, use ARIA to mark our templates in ways that we want to describe exactly and explicitly what the component is doing to make it more accessible. So for example, using ARIA labels, um, using ARIA to add live regions, using it to add a role if it's a div that maybe has an a, uh, is being used for a different type of role or something like that. And so ARIA is going to have three components. It's going to have your role, your state, and your properties. So this would be an example like um, button checked uh, for uh, avocado. 
And so I have my role, which is a button, the checked, which is the state that it's in, and the property, which is the label for or something like that. And so making sure that we're reading in that same content order so that all HTML is being read the same. Um, this is really important for things like lazy loading, again, things with custom properties in Angular. Again, we have all of these different ways to customize and create cool components. But we want to make sure that we're doing it in a way that uh, uh, utilizes HTML and utilizes some of the basics of web development and brings them into Angular to make them more accessible. And then finally, uh, this is the most important one of anything, and it's to test and then test and then test some more and then test again. Um, and so let's talk about some ways to do that. So accessibility testing is definitely something that takes a comprehensive approach. Uh, there's all different types. So there's um, at, at your basic level, you're going to want to add accessibility attributes into lint rules uh, project wide. I think that's a great way to get started. So using attributes in lint like template accessibility alt text to make sure that you're checking that all um, templates have alternative text when needed um, or uh, to create that semantic HTML, right? Or label for things like that. So adding it into your linting is a great way to make sure that at least at the development level that it's starting to be incorporated. And then when we get broader, we have manual and we have automated accessibility testing. And so on the web, um, we can automate a lot of the different things. So we can add like screenshot tests that use tools like Axe or screen readers to make sure that um, things like contrast, color contrast, um, things that maybe are incorporated in design. So touch targets, things that are static attributes are uh, included. Um, so we can definitely try and automate as many of those sort of static checks along the way. And there's some great ways to do that within your protractor Cypress tests um, or within your end-to-end -end tests as a whole. But then we also want to think about the fact that we can't automate everything, right? So a lot of accessibility does have to do with manual testing because it has to do with making sure that the content makes sense, that it reads intuitively, that the flow is intuitive, that it you know, is hitting all of the components that you want it to hit. And so there is a cognitive part of it and a, a human attribute to it. So without, uh, th there always is going to be a use case for manual testing in this case. And so when you're manually testing, I would encourage everyone on the team to understand what that actually looks like. Um, there's some great videos out there of what using a screener to actually looks like, but it's important if you're going to be testing as a user to think or to at least understand and understand um, what that use case actually looks like because a novice at a screen reader is probably not going to test the same way that someone who is um, using services for multiple years may look like. Um, Let's see. Uh, so there's some great ways to do this with Axe, um, but basically just making sure that you're checking things like navigation order, basically all of the previous 10 things I talked about that you're checking for this in testing, that you're incorporating it in Lint, end-to-end -end unit, that you're hitting it on all these different places is a great way to do it. I would also suggest maybe running a uh, initial review of accessibility. So doing sort of a current diagnostic review of where you're at with your application. Um, triaging issues as needed, and then thinking about incorporating from number one all the way up until 11 in all future development steps. So that's a great way to sort of, if maybe you already have something out there and you're concerned about accessibility, starting with testing and seeing where you're at and making sort of a comprehensive plan of how to move forward and start incorporating um, all of the other previous 10 things I talked about in the future. So with that, um, I just want to say thank you and I would love to talk to you on Twitter. Hey, thanks, Emma. That was really helpful. Those were some uh, you know, great tips to make web accessible to everyone. And uh, uh, I, I can't think of any other way that you could have put it. You know, um, it's probably the best way possible you put it, them together. And it was really helpful for me. And I'm pretty sure it will be helpful for everybody else listening to it. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Okay, people, so we are heading to the lunch break and uh, we will again meet up at, at 2.45 p.m. UTC plus one. Thanks for watching.
Welcome back from lunch. I'm Shalki Nakpal from GGD Dublin and your host for next three sessions. Uh, since it is just after lunch, I hope you all are not sleepy. If so, I have a perfect talk scheduled for you. Let's break stereotypes and build inclusivity with comics by Alice. So um, I'm going to add Alice in. Hi, Alice. How are you today? Uh, Alice, you're on mute. My bad. Rookie That's mistake. <laughs> how are you today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good too. Uh, it's been a long day with lots of sessions, but it's great. Yeah. Nice. My oh. day has just started. I'm uh, here in New York. <laughs> so. Wow, okay. <laughs> good luck with that. Um, Thank so, you. Yeah. Over to you. Okay. Great. Hey everyone, I'm Alice. I'm a senior Android engineer that's worked in the tech industry for over five years. Um, I previously worked at Pinterest and Patreon. I'm doing some consulting now. I've uh, consulted for seed stage companies and um, been working on some curriculum work for a nonprofit. And this is the way that I normally introduce myself at a tech conference. But in reality, um, I'm so much more than that. Your perception of me might be something like, I'm a female software engineer, but my identity is so much more than what I do at work. I do so much more than code. And I've often struggled with my identity in tech because I don't feel like I fully fit in. I don't have the same level of a passion that I feel like everyone else has. And so I decided to create comics about it. As a high school artist turned programmer, I decided to combine these two interests and talk about it. Um, and I drew comics showcasing my own and other people's experiences in the tech industry. And I started to realize through that, that there's a lot of people who feel similarly about being in tech. So today I wanted to talk about inclusivity. I think that we can have a world where we all feel comfortable presenting our diverse selves at work. But in order to do that, we need to all participate. It can't be the job of a single person or the HR team. We need to all think about how to build an inclusive workplace. And I just wanna state this, um, having conversations about diversity and inclusion can feel uncomfortable. I definitely feel uncomfortable right now because I don't think I'm an expert on building inclusive workplaces, but I think that it's worth talking about and it's worth talking about by individuals such as us, ourselves. So I'm gonna ask your permission to be vulnerable with me while I go over seven principles that I think are um, how to build an inclusive workspace. So my first principle is to build self-awareness. I want you to close your eyes. Imagine a software developer. Okay, let's make this a little bit more specific and say that it's a senior software engineer at a reputable tech company, one that's really good at their job. What is their personality like? What is their educational level? What do they look like? What's their age? So when I first started in tech, I had a lot of assumptions about characteristics of a good software developer. I don't wanna say that these assumptions are correct, but I think that a lot of people have the same kind of assumptions. Assumptions like they have to have a software degree uh, and be a graduate of a university or college. That they're probably pretty young, uh, maybe like in their 20s that they're introverted, they keep to themselves. I think a lot of media tends to portray software engineers as introverted, that they're really passionate about programming. So much so that they contribute to open source, they have side projects, they read up on code in the evenings or on the weekends, and they use certain OS. So not Windows OS, they have to use a certain ID, they have to use a certain tool. And they probably are male because that's what a lot of people see um, in the media. And honestly, this was kind of reaffirming in some ways. 
um, I had a lot of these assumptions about what a software engineer um, should be. And I felt like I didn't fit into them. And so it was confirmation when I failed that I wasn't a good programmer. I'm pretty sure that a lot of you all might not fit into all these things that I have assumed, but they affect your confidence and other uh, and the perspective of others. We have conformity bias. When a well uh, and when a group of well-respected individuals present in a certain way or say that a technology is better, especially at a tech conference, we tend to agree. We're not checking our own biases before we make that assumption. And the thing is, there are a lot of unconscious biases out there that could affect our own and other people's performance. So what I do now is I try to remind myself, especially when making decisions that impact others, like interviewing them for a job, giving them performance review, I try to check my assumptions. I remind myself of this because our perspectives and assumptions are shaped by our background and experiences. And where did my internal biases come from? Well, it came from a lot of the media that I consumed, what my parents or friends told me at the time, a lot of the um, students that were in my classroom. A lot of these things we don't actually have full control over. So what I'm proposing is not a quick solution. Self-awareness is a skill. It takes intention and time to want to develop. But I know that by harnessing my awareness, I can take steps to ensuring that I don't let my privilege bias my actions and it'll make a more equitable workplace for everyone. So the second principle that I want to talk about is to encourage psychological safety. I want to tell you a story about an experience I had many, many years ago um, when I was interning at a major tech company. I was initially so elated when I got this offer because it was my first time getting an offer like this. Um, and it was with a company that was pretty well known. So I thought it would look really good on my resume. But then about a month into the internship, I heard one of the most defeating things to hear as a junior engineer. You're asking too many questions. I spent most of that internship taking that feedback really literally and trying to figure out everything that I, uh, everything myself. And I ended up really struggling. Suffice to say, they didn't give me a return offer and I felt really defeated. Because I was so early in my career, I didn't have the experience to realize that that job wasn't the right environment for me. It wasn't until the next internship that I landed that I started to grow confidence in my own abilities. There, I had the support and mental safety I needed to survive, uh, to thrive. Um, I had a mentor um, that built up psychological safety with the entire team, myself included. And I wondered now that if I didn't have that next internship pan out, would I be here even talking to you guys? There is this popular piece of advice that flows around. Fake it until you make it. This advice suggests that the best way to achieve success is to hide behind a facade. I think this advice is the epitome of imposter syndrome, which I'm pretty sure you all have heard about at this point. How many of you all have experienced imposter syndrome before? I think that when we think that people are all achieving success, when in reality, um, a lot of us are still having imposter syndrome, even when we're giving a talk. I think instead, we should think of success being, uh, we should think of success as being able to admit that we don't have it figured out every single day. This is actually proven through studies. At a study done by Google with over 200 teams, it was found that the highest performing teams are the ones with psychological safety. So how do we encourage psychological safety? Well, one advice that I like to give a lot of junior, mentor, uh, junior engineers that I mentor is to spend time learning on the job. That means reading the code base, 
asking questions, being inquisitive, rather than measuring your own performance by the number of lines of code you push out. I actually found that doing this improved my productivity over time, and I actually spent more time understanding the nuances of the libraries or the code that I used, rather than worrying about how to push out more code or what it looked like to others. It also means encouraging honesty when it comes to our mistakes. In teams where I didn't feel psychologically safe, I spent a lot of time comparing my mistakes and worrying about how I compared with others. And I asked myself questions like, am I coding fast enough? Do I look like I'm being productive? What do other people think of me? Where in safe environments, I knew that if I underestimated a feature or I wasn't being productive enough that week, that I wouldn't be overly anxious. Especially when you have seniority, it helps a ton to open up an environment to talk about failure. And in meetings, I like to incorporate time for us to just talk about wins and give other praise rather than thinking about who to blame. So my third principle um, in order to have psychological safety is that we wanna avoid projecting our opinions onto others. How many of you have heard these phrases spoken before? Coding this was really easy. You should finish this in no time. How could you not know this already? Front end is not real programming or insert a different language here. A lot of these opinions, although thrown casually in conversations, they don't have malicious intent, but often invoke people's feelings of shame. They can really alienate people who are doing something new and heighten that feeling of imposter syndrome. For my own instance, they made me feel really incompetent. When people said coding this was so easy, I thought, well, I don't find it easy. So does that mean that I'm not a good programmer? When they said, you should already know this already, I thought that I started too late. I should have started way earlier. I should have started learning how to program way earlier. And when they said that you should finish this in no time, then my thought was, well, I can try to pretend like I could finish this fast by working all evening. So rather than projecting your opinions, let others come to their own conclusions. Rather than saying things like, you should do this, or this is easy, start with, from my experience. From my experience, this tool had a low learning curve and it only took me a couple of days to understand how to use it. Maybe you should try it too. My fourth principle is to learn to give good feedback. I am gonna be the first to admit that I find feedback um, very intimidating. I'm a really non-confrontational person, so I want everyone to like me and giving feedback gives me a lot of anxiety. And in the past, I've had circumstances where I would hold it in. I wouldn't give the feedback and I would oftentimes feel resentful about minor things that my coworkers are doing. Or I would feel resentful about myself because I didn't bring it up in time and now it's too late to talk about it. But in order to build an inclusive workspace, we have to be honest and transparent with each other. That feedback could actually be useful and by holding it back, you might be limiting someone's abilities. So nowadays, I try to come up with a framework when I give others feedback. Great feedback is both actionable, kind, and well-timed. Inactionable feedback means that you're making a broad statement. Basically, you're making something that could be interpreted in many ways, like you're not contributing enough code. The statement kind of makes me feel kind of defensive. And I wanna tell you that, well, the reason I haven't been is because, which doesn't actually solve the issue. Inactionable feedback also could be personality-based, which is often something that people in the marginalized groups get as feedback. Something like, you could use more confidence. I don't actually know how to take action on that kind of feedback. 
In order to create actionable feedback, offer a solution rather than just pointing out the problem. And you can also point to a particular instance that it happened rather than making a broad statement. So as an example, after I've completed a project, I might have a one-on-one -on -one with a coworker and just talk about what are all the things that I could have done in order to improve for next time. Also, when feedback isn't well-timed, it can elicit a defensive response. Have you ever been ambushed with feedback after a meeting or given drive-by feedback where someone just told you the feedback and then immediately left not wanting to hear your response? Or alternatively, that you waited too long and you build up the feedback to the point where it can feel overwhelming and it's no longer helpful because it's been too long. Instead of doing this, you can ask them how they would like to receive the feedback. Maybe even ask them what medium they would like to receive it. I think a lot of people have different personalities and prefer different mediums because of the way that they communicate. Kind feedback means that you're open to hearing the other person's thoughts and having an open dialogue. Once you start building a culture of giving feedback, it's actually far less intimidating to keep going. When you're giving small pieces of feedback every uh, once in a while, it feels a lot less intimidating than giving a single piece of feedback over the course of a few months. And if you're a non-confrontational person like me, I would really recommend checking out this infographic called The Non-Confrontational Person's Guide to Conflict. All right, the fifth principle is to write with the beginner in mind. This means writing code or documentation. Once we become more experienced at building software, we start to lose sight of what actually goes into the building process. All of those years of experience, the context, memory of libraries, tools that were used, we're building procedural habits that we created for ourselves and they go unnoticed. So that's until someone else who isn't familiar with the code base tries to do the same thing. How many of you all have come across code or documentation for APIs that you just can't seem to make sense of no matter how hard you try? The thing is, I didn't realize how much context I was leaving out of um, documentation or code until I started to teach others and give talks internally and externally. I realized that how much of that knowledge I actually could not explain to someone else well. I think it's so important to build inclusivity by spending time mentoring others and making sure that you transfer knowledge because you might not realize how good your knowledge is of something until you start teaching it to someone else. And I think it's also a good reminder that we're all at different stages of our learning process. I think it's so important that we remember that even though we might be the expert in one area, we'll eventually go on to do something that we're not an expert at. And we need to keep that beginner's perspective in mind so that we don't end up making things more complicated than it needs to be. My sixth principle is that diversity is everyone's job. As someone who cares about diversity, it's hard for me to see that so much of the diversity and inclusion tasks are relegated to people in the marginalized group. This ends up causing certain people to become these invisible superheroes where they end up working two jobs in order to ensure that diversity happens within the company. At one point in my last job, I decided to take on the head of being an employee resource group at work, only to realize that I never realized how much effort that people put into this and never received the appreciation that they deserve. The thing is, inclusion at work cannot happen without diversity as well. So we shouldn't be handing diversity as a second job 
to marginalized groups. And how do we do that? Well, we can be an ally. We can do this by sponsoring others and ensuring um, that we shine light on their accomplishments. We can be transparent with our salary and benefits so that more people know how much they're worth. We can um, understand how to answer questions around diversity so that we're prepared for them and we don't have to pass them off to someone else. We can advocate for standardizing hiring practices so that we're not getting special treatment versus someone else. And we can also just use our voice and call others out. When someone else tells, when you notice that someone else is making assumptions about someone, you can just give them a light prod and nudge them towards the right way. By doing that, we can all be in this together. These small actions build inclusive environments for everyone. And my last point, and honestly, the most meta one is to talk about it, like what I'm doing now, and empower others to, too. I'd like to end off by talking about my own journey into tech. When I first started, I had this assumption of what a stereotypical programmer looked like. And I felt really conflicted because I didn't feel like I felt uh, I fit into that stereotype. I asked questions like, did I start too late? I don't know what I'm doing though. Maybe I just got lucky. But over time with the right work environment, with working with allies and being surrounded by some kick-ass software developers, I developed more confidence. And I realized that I didn't need to prove my worth by being someone that I'm not. So I decided to break down the stereotype rather than fit into it. I'm pr proud to contribute to the breakdown of tech stereotypes. And I think you should be too. I think 2020 has been a hell of a year, but there are also some silver linings. With the shift in tech culture and of us going remote, we can reinvent our work culture as well. So I'd leave you with this question. I told you my own personal thoughts about how we can foster inclusivity at work, but I think you probably have ideas. So let's continue the conversation. Tweet at me at names Alice. And if you're really interested in learning more, here are some really awesome resources to check out. Um, Project Include and Inclusion Network are have some really good content. And if you're interested in learning more about what comics I create, check out alicentechland.org and you can follow me on Instagram or Twitter. Thanks so much. Um, I had a great time talking. That was a great talk, Alice. Thanks. Um, I, I genuinely love some of some of the tips you, you gave. And I could totally relate with what I had I had to go through in during my first jobs. So yeah, that was really, really good. And um, yeah, it was nice um, talking to you. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. I'll welcome next speaker now. Okay. So uh, that was Alice. Um, our next talk is on neurodiversity by Rol. Hey, Rol, how are you today? Oh. OK, uh, how do I search? Skin? Oh, here we go. Yes, sir. Sir, okay. Over to you. I'm gonna. I'm, try, I'm trying to share that. Ah, there we go. Go. Good. We are a little bit early. Uh, should we give people a little break or do I start straight away? Uh, you could start straight away. That's fine. Okay. So uh, welcome everyone. Very happy to be here on this uh, inclusion and diversity track. And today I'm going to talk to you about neurodiversity. So first question would be, what, what is neurodiversity? And if we go on and look online for the definitions, we can find a lot of them, but I just gonna show you two of them. The first one is 
is neurodiversity is the range of differences in individual brain function and behavioral traits regarded as part of normal variation in the human population. It's not very easy to understand. It's a bit, sounds complicated, but let's talk another one. So it says, neurodiversity is a concept when neurological differences are to be recognized and respected as any other human variation. So if you put the two definitions together, you kind of get the idea that there's people whose brain function, behavioral traits, neurological differences in general, make them different. And this is normal. This should be accepted as any other type of diversity. Okay, that sounds big, strange, right? So what do we mean when we say that this brain works differently? Uh, you may have heard of this being talked in a different way. For example, autism. Autism is one of the most typical cases of when a person's brain works differently, but it's not the only one. We also have ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, dyslexia and dyspraxia. So the four are important, but today I'm going to focus just on autism. But neurodiversity is a term that works for all of them. I'm just going to focus a little bit because I would be talking forever otherwise. And we have a long way to go. The first step is always like awareness. And I have the impression that awareness has gone a long way and we're doing a lot better. For example, a few years ago, the only media representation of autistic people that you will find will be Reinman, which is not the best representation. And today you have a lot of other situations. You have a Netflix show called Atypical, another Netflix show called uh, Love in the Spectrum. Uh, there is a Sesame Street Muppet that is autistic. One of the Power Rangers is autistic. One character you know, you know, Overwatch is autistic. And these are just the ones that come top of mind. So there are a lot of representation of autistic people in media. And that helps with people being aware that this condition actually exists. But this is not the end. This is, this is the beginning of the path. Because after awareness comes acceptance. It's like we are, we are aware that these people is different, but we also want them to be accepted in society. And while that sounds good, again, it's not enough. Because acceptance means we allow you to build safe spaces for you to be here in society, but we don't want to be mixed with you. We accept you, but we don't include you. And that's why we want to go to the third and final stage, which is inclusion, where everybody is together in the same place and there's no problem about being different. Now, how common is autism, right? Turns out, it's a lot more common than you would think. Last, uh, last statistics I, I read, it was like one in 64 kids in Ireland have uh, an autism diagnosis. The states from the states, the states from the United States are similar. I think it's one in 48, something like that. But it's pretty much the same about all uh, developed countries. That means almost 2% of the kids have autism. It's a significant amount of people. Two percent is, is a lot. So the next question I usually get is, okay, how does autism look like? And this is a very hard question because as it happens, autism is an invisible disability. Autism doesn't look like anything. It's just invisible, it's in the brain. It's not something you can see from the people from the outside like you can see when you see someone which is of a different color, of a different ethnicity or a different gender, that you can see. Autism, you cannot see it, it is invisible. Yeah, I know, I know, really. You want to know, right? How does autism look like? Like, 
there are certain common patterns and traits that people have and you can you can tell us how does it look like but in fact autism is called a spectrum but it's not a linear spectrum it's more like a lot of different things that can present in each person in a different way so we have this common saying that says if you've met one person with autism you've met one person with autism and that is true sorry one second but I'm back. so what one person can have problems speaking and problems with language another kid can have hyperlexia and use a lot of more words and words very specific so you can't really give an definition of this is how an autistic person behaves because it's so different that you cannot have a single one. Okay, fine. I know what you're thinking. But give us some concrete examples. I, I, you can do that. But yes, I can. And you may have noticed I actually skipped my presentation slide because, hello, my name is Raul Portales and I'm autistic. Uh, what I have is what it used to be called Asperger syndrome, but now it's all enclosing to the autism spectrum. Some of the traits I have is that I have very strong personal special interests. One of them is computers. It all started uh, when I was like 10 or 12, and this was my first computer. It's probably 30 something years old now, but this is where it all started. And I also had problems interacting with people. And I have a very, very little mind, which is another typical autistic trait. So suddenly I found computers that were super interesting. You could do a lot of things with them. And turns out they, they expected you to talk to them in very specific ways, very structured, very logical. No second meanings, no hidden meanings, nothing. It was great. And I made it my profession. Um, I also found that, as I said, interacting with other people is, is pretty hard for me, but I found that public speaking is hard for everybody. So suddenly I found a lot of resources. And in fact, for me, chit chat and public speaking is about as hard, same level of anxiety and all that stuff. So I found public speaking super easy and I love it. And I kept doing that. So I actually joined the GDG Dublin. I've spoken there many times and as a, as a succession of that, I ended up working on Android and I became a Google developer expert with all the public speaking and work with the community that done of the years. Now, computers are not my only special interest. I have other special interests like fantasy, for example. I, I really like Lord of the Rings. These movies are like very old nowadays, but, but they are really cool. And I know you're probably thinking, a lot of people like Lord of the Rings. Yeah, I know. but. When I talk about the special intense interest in autism, I'm talking about, I actually can read the Quenya. Quenya is the, lang the tongue that the elves use in the movies. No, actually, no, really. The tongue the elves use in the movies is called Sindarin, but there's not enough um, text in Sindarin to make up a grammar, but Quenya, which is the oldest language, they actually have a grammar and they have a writing, which is about the same, and you can actually learn it. And I can read, the uh, the wandering scripture, which is not exactly Quenya, is the tongue of Mordor, which is derived from the Quenya, but similar enough that you can actually make up for. I think you get the idea. I'm gonna stop it here. A special interest and a strong interest. That's how they represent in us. Okay. So the other question I get a lot is how. Okay, but how does how does it feel? This this is really weird. You perceive the world in a different way. So. How can, I, how can I relate to your experiences? And it's very complicated because the way we experience the world is very different. But I found that this new normal when we are living today gives us a couple of examples that you could have experienced that can help you understand how we feel. So I'm gonna give you two examples. The first one is that since we started everybody with this giant remote work experience, most of our interactions are on messaging. And people find very stressful that when you only have text, you don't have nonverbal language, you don't have tone, you don't have body language. 
And the only thing you have is the words and their meaning. And it makes very hard to understand what this person actually means. And for me and for many other people in this autistic spectrum, there's no difference. All these other side, uh, side channels that you used to call what your speaker is trying to tell to you, I, I cannot actually read them. So for me, messaging puts at all of us in, a, in an even playing field, which is interesting. Imagine if whenever you are talking to someone, you only get the text. That could help you relate to us. The other one is uh, that we are doing a lot of video conferences, and I keep hearing about Zoom fatigue. Uh, because, you know, video conferencing is different from face-to-face -face interaction. It's more demanding to read your host, to read the people you're talking to. And for me, it isn't. And I talked to some of the people in the spectrum, and it is the same for them. It's not for everybody, but it's quite common. So it's not that video conferences are not hard for us. It's that face-to-face -face interactions are as hard as a Zoom meeting. So put yourself back into place whenever you go back to the office in a physical location and you're having face-to-face -face interaction. Imagine if those were as draining as video conferences on Zoom. That is how most of us feel. Now, that's just silver lining on all the things that is happening with the, with the pandemic that can help you relate to us. But let's go back to the topic of integration. And uh, why is integration important? Well, we need to put everybody in society. And I'm going to focus in particular on work because work is really important the amount of unemployment in, in the autism community is really, really high. And it's a lot of people want to actually work. When you want to work and you can't, and your society has almost no unemployment, it's a very frustrating situation. And it leads to anxiety, depression, and a lot of other related problems. So where can autistic people work? Well, we can work anywhere, really. But there are some places where our differences play in our advantage. So, for example, in the acts and in acting, when you perceive the world in a different way and you make art like paintings or whatever that reflects how you see the world, suddenly people realize that, wow, this is so different from anything else. Like, well, it's the only way we can do it. Acting is also very interesting because it has a very specific set of rules on how you have to behave. And it makes it a lot easier for autistic people. IT, when you have very uh, strong interest in computers, you are a very logical um, person, very literal. IT kind of fits really well into it. it. It does for me. Not everybody in the autistic spectrum fits here, but it's a very, it's a common fit. Admin and office work. Uh, okay. Another typical autistic trait is that we like routine and we like order and we like everything to be in its place. Now, imagine an office where your job is to make sure every document is in the right box in the right place. And you all you have to do is to sort things in the right place. It may sound boring, but for some people, it is super satisfying. Scientific guarantee, uh, if you ever try to do um, PhD, you know how it feels. You are picking something very small and you're focusing your energy on advancing that piece forward. Now, which better way to focus on something very specific than having a, a strong special interest on that thing and laser focus on it? Oh, that's another one. You can, you can hyper-focus. It's like being in the zone but bigger. So it's a really good fit for people that is based on scientific R&D. And finally, uh, libraries and museum. If you have a special interest, you want to learn everything about it, and then you want to talk about it with other people, and most people will find it uh, tiresome. But imagine that you can find a museum that is dedicated to your special interest. People will come here to your museum to hear about your special interest, that's amazing. Like for example, the train museum in Madrid in Spain, 
the director is autistic and her special interest was dreams. So it's like a perfect dream job. So neurodiversity is a win-win. We are not talking about letting autistic people into the workplace. We are saying there are works where an autistic person is actually better than a neurotypical person. A neurotypical person, by the way, means people that is not neurodiverse, most of the people. So this, besides having people with different points of view in your team, in your community, in your group of friends being beneficial, there are certain cases on which being autistic is actually an advantage. So this is not just a win for autistic people, it's a win for everybody. Some example of, uh, some quotes about inclusion, uh, the world needs all kinds of minds. And I think this is valid for every diversity on this track. When you get people from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different genders, each one of them gives something different to the table and we complement and we find a much bigger picture. Now, imagining on top of that, you can have someone whose perception of the world is completely different from yours. And you need to have people from all places. You don't want to have only autistic people or only um, neurotypical people working together. You want them mixed because when you mix this type of minds is when things get better. Temple Grandin is autistic. She's one of the best experts on animal slaughterhouses because she can see the things from the point of view of the animal. He, she revolutionized the industry. And there's a fantastic biopic about her history, which if you're interested, you could check it out. Now, another one is like, not everything that is stepped out of line and is abnormal, meaning not normal, must necessarily be inferior. This quote is from Hans Asperger, who is the person that defined Asperger syndrome. So he knows what he's talking about. And that's a key message. Being not normal doesn't mean we are inferior. Or you may have heard the other way of saying this is different, but not less. And with all the things I've told you, you have probably realized that autistic people have very similar traits or the archetypical engineers. They want to work on something very specific. They only talk about that. They can get absorbed. They, yeah. Well, it was been called the engineer's disorder. And as Hans Asperger again said, it seems that for success in science or art, a dash of autism is essential. That does not mean that you have to be autistic to have success on science or art, but having some autistic traits to a certain extent will play on your advantage. So moving forward, STEM, benefits from, from autistic people, like from autism, ASD, Autism Spectrum Disorder, by the way, I'm not sure if I said it before. And without autistic people focusing and pushing and trying to do things their way, we probably wouldn't have that many scientific improvements as we have today on IT and on scientific R&D. Another quote to illustrate this, this is, um, Turing, Alan Turing, who was not diagnosed as autistic, but if you've read about his life and you've seen the movie The Imitation Game, he really had very strong autistic traits. We cannot go back in time and diagnose him, but he actually saw a lot of autistic traits. Anyway, he said, sometimes it's the people no one can imagine anything of who do the things no one can imagine. I think it's a very powerful message. There is a lot of misconception that autistic people cannot do a lot of things, but if you give them a chance, they may surprise you by doing these things in a completely different way, in a novel way, and possibly in a better way. Now, you may, you may know this company, like it's reasonably well known in the tech industry, and their slogan is think different. We are talking about thinking inside the box and outside the box. When you perceive the world in a different way, even when you think 
inside the box. The box of neurotypical people is here. The box of autistic people is in a lot of different places. So even when I think inside the box, all the neurotypical people think I'm thinking outside the box. It's a complete radical approach. And by the way, to me it's the same thing. I, I find all the other people think in a very strange way, but they are all of them. So for me it's normal that people think in a way that is different than mine. Um, and again, coming back to the engineer's disorder, geeks are possibly an early interpretation of autistic traits before the autistic diagnosis was evolving to what it is today. And there's an interesting story about Steve Silverman, who is a um, journalist, a scientific journalist. He went around and started interviewing people in Silicon Valley and found that a lot of successful people in Silicon Valley had kids that were autistic. And he started thinking like, how is this? He started checking how many of these autistic traits were actually considered good for people in Silicon Valley. And he wrote this article called The Geek Syndrome in the New York Times in 2001. But he found it so interesting that he kept digging and wrote a book called Neurotribes, which is an amazing work of research, of journalist research, which I recommend you if you want to go deeper into the topic. So finally, let's focus a little bit into neurodiverse IT. How, how does IT fit into neurodiversity, right? Where are we? What can we do? We are full of geeks. Geeks are having a lot of autistic traits. Possibly the amount of people that is undiagnosed without this in IT is very high. So chances that autistic people in IT is higher than 2% are very high. We don't know because they are not diagnosed, but it's a safe assumption. So what can we do and why is this important? Well, GDG is not just about tech and the death test is not about tech. Proof is we have an entire track about diversity and inclusion. The GDG is about building a community, a community where everybody can join and everybody's welcome. And we want to make this community as welcoming as possible for everyone. So simple as that, we want to accommodate everyone's need. That's what we can do as GDG organizers, as GDG attendees. Some things we've done in the past. We use color communication badges in the GDG Dublin a um, couple of days ago, which is you hold your badge with these colors. That means green, I'm open to talk to you. Yellow, uh, only talk to me if I, if I know you. Red, I'm not in the mood of talking. This is really good for autistic people that cannot read other people's expression. I may not be able to know if you are open to talk to me or not by your body expression. And may I reach out to you and you don't want to be interrupted or whatever. So the same goes the other way around. I may not be communicating my body language properly. I may be in a corner with my arm crossed, but I'm really willing for talking to some other people, but they just don't control my body language. This clarifies that you are open to, to talk to people or you are not. Maybe you are super stressed and you don't want to talk to anyone, but you still want to be around. This is a very way, a very unequivocal way to send a signal. Now, other thing we did is to provide a quiet room, which is a place where there is no noise. Autism usually comes with sensory processing disorder, like super sensitive to low noises, or to smells. So if you're feeling uh, overwhelmed with all this, you want to go to a place where you can rest. And in fact, a virtual conference is much better than this. If you feel overwhelmed, you can just relax, tune it down, and it's fine. But this is some stuff we did when we were doing uh, GDG events in a physical location. Now, what can you do? Like, What's your action point after all these things I've been talking about, about diversity, about neurodiversity? And it's very easy because everybody in the autistic spectrum is different. You ask, is there anything I can do for you? Is this bothering you? Is this okay? What do you need? Which support do you need? And just ask and each person will tell you. Like for me, I really 
find distracting the people walks behind my back and it breaks my concentration. So when we were in the office, I'm I'm with the back to the wall. And it is it's wonderful. Other people prefer the exact opposite. I don't know. But ask and we'll tell you. So for example, I do a lot of fidgeting, which in autism is called steaming. It's very similar to fidgeting, but slightly different. We move our hands and we have something uh, or moving back and forth or rhythmic motions or something we can have our hands entertained. It helps us with focus and with anxiety. So this is a photo of my actual desk in the office. When I have a kendama, a fidgeting cube, the glary, which is this thing with the two small uh, balls, um, Rubik's cube, um, modified pen to do pen spinning, and these are all things I use for fidgeting and keeping my attention on and talking to people. And my team has been super supportive about this. They never made a fuss about anything. My current team and my previous team as well in my previous company. And they actually were curious about what is this and they tried it. And yes, micro juggling, which is what all these things are composed to, is another one of my special interests. I could talk about it for hours, but not today. Let people feed it, let people steam, don't make a big fuss of it. Be curious about it. Maybe, maybe you find that it's actually good for you too. Uh, so finally, if you want to summarize it in a single word, which is close to what the previous talk was talking about, just be nice to autistic people. We're different. We'll probably be doing things in a different way, but we don't want to be taken apart, which is different. And I know what you're thinking. I told it at the beginning, autism is an invisible disability. So how do I know that this person is autistic if they haven't disclosed it? How can I do this? Very easy. Just be nice to other people. Regardless of their condition, maybe they're autistic, maybe they are not. Maybe they are undiagnosed. Maybe they are having a bad day. It doesn't really matter. How about we try to accommodate everyone, regardless of their disability or the knowledge of it. Just be nice to other people, be more accommodating, be uh, less demanding, be more accepting. And with that, we can just make the world a better place for everyone. Thank you. That was just amazing. I think I have learned quite a lot um, from your talk, Raul. It was so, so informative. Um, I have a question here. I'm going to um, bring it on the screen. I think you kind of addressed a bit of it, but then still, uh, if you have more uh, tips. So it's from Rachel. Um, do you have any advice on what you can do to make in-person events better, less exhausting for people with autism? Oh, that's a really good question. It really depends on each person, but um, I'm gonna say it's very typical that autistic people don't keep eye contact. And we do it not because we don't want to look at people, it's because it's so much information that it blocks us from understanding other people. So we usually look on the floor or around and we don't look at people's eyes when they're talking. It's actually a coping mechanism for processing the information better or moving our hands or playing with something while we are actually trying to focus. It actually helps with focus. Now, what you can do is when you see someone doing that, don't pay any attention to it. Like it's normal. You're not looking at me when I talk to you, fine. I'm not going to even mention it. And just by that, uh, you will make it a lot easier. Maybe if you see someone that is starting to show sense of being um, overwhelmed, Take a break on the meeting and come back in five minutes. Because I, I personally, I can talk for myself. I love uh, interacting with people, uh, but it totally drains me. So maybe at the end of the day, you can find a person that is unable to cope with more in-person meetings. Just if you see them, offer them to take a break. You seem like you're very tired. Do you want to take a break and we come back later? And it will probably benefit everyone as well. But in general, ask them. 
yep that was that pretty much addressed um the question um i have another one here from stefano um he would like to clarify uh, that neurodiverse can also mean a person with adhd dyslexia and a whole lot of other conditions yeah uh, we started the talk a little bit earlier but that was my third slide was that neurodiversity is everything that has a different brain condition i mentioned autism adhd dyslexia and dyspraxia as the most common ones but yeah everybody whose brain works in a different way is a neurodiverse person for sure uh, uh, to add to the question, um, is it very often that dyslexia is confused with autism and vice versa? Not really. It, sometimes they are related, but dyslexia is, is very different from, from autism. They work in, uh, the brain is different in different ways. Okay. I don't think it's, uh, there's that confusion. Okay. Um, I don't have further questions. Um, that was a great talk, Raul. Nice talking to you. Uh, yep. you um, and welcome, Kevin. Oh, cool. thank you. Um, so moving on um, to our third talk, um, it is from Kevin. Um, the topic is removing racially charged language from technology. So, hi, Kevin. How are you today? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good, too. Hi, um, let's, I can get my my slide shared here. Yeah, uh, you could. And I, I'll just uh, leave you there. I'm on. Excellent. Are you able to see them? Yes, they're working. Excellent. All right. Well, uh, uh, so happy to be here today. Uh, it's been uh, really great listening. I got to hear uh, Raul's talk and I have a child with autism, so really appreciated that insight. So uh, thank you so much for that. All right. Well, um, as she mentioned, you know, my talk today is about uh, removing racially charged language from technology. Uh, I've had a bit of experience with this lately uh, and been doing it for a while, but it's um, it's been interesting. So I wanted to, to give some people some feedback and uh, some learning experience that I had from it. So a little bit about myself. Uh, my new role is I'm the principal evangelist at Dido. I'm also a Google Workspace uh, top contributor, Google developer expert and ambassador. Uh, I've also done a lot with the uh, Google ecosystem and uh, email security and cybersecurity is one of my areas of expertise. So that is not a photoshopped can of uh, uh, fake uh, spam that's a real brand in Canada. So uh, you'll find it as my avatar on LinkedIn. I love chatting with people about things, so don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, I will post these slides there as well. But uh, pretty much uh, before I get started, I wanted to just kind of give some framework so that our foundation. Uh, and the first thing I want to talk about is the Apache Software Foundation because it ties into this story quite a bit. So the, the Apache Software Foundation is a US-based uh, 501c3 charity. That's a special deter determination by the international, uh, the, uh, what do you call it? The IRS, our, our uh, tax organization. Um, we're usually just called Apache or the ASF. Uh, a lot of people know us from you know, the HTTP server, which is our granddaddy project, and also the ASLv2 license. It's a very business-friendly license. Um, what we do at the ASF is we provide software for the public good, and we do this by giving the services and support as an umbrella uh, for a very diverse uh, number of software projects. I think there's about 400 projects underneath the umbrella today in the open source world. Um, and we do this to build communities, and we do it at no charge. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got a frog in my throat. Give me a second. One of the things that we are is we're a meritocracy, or at least the good parts of a meritocracy. So what we like to do is basically people earn merit and uh, they do so uh, as a key part of the Apache way. So, you know, you don't really get an inherent right to vote. You have to earn your right to vote. So a little bit different there, but it's judged by your community. And uh, one of the important parts about the inclusion that I'm very proud of is that, you know, the earning merit, especially in the Internet, um, has no bearing on your age, sex, religion, socioeconomic status, you know, sexual preference, et cetera. 
And, you know, that's really uh, one of the great things about the Internet is, you know, you can be chatting with somebody and, you know, not know anything about them. Um, you know, you're just sending emails back and forth and getting stuff done and earning merit. Um, and that's a great part of uh, working with a foundation like the Apache Software Foundation. So, you know, one of the things we do is we try and make inclusion very important. Um, Alice's talk was very important to me because uh, I, I think it's something that we struggle with. You know, uh, I grew up where, you know, largely males only did computers and, and the engineering class I was in only had two females in it. Uh, but, uh, you know, that is changing. And, you know, so one of the things we talk about at the ASF to try and improve this is we talk about the fact that community is more important than code, which is kind of interesting for an organization that produces open source software. But the way we define it is if tomorrow all the servers crashed and we lost all the code, uh, we'd be, you know, it'd be bad, but we still have our communities and they could probably rewrite the code better than it was the first time. But we lose our communities it's the whole different matter. You know, the code is going to die eventually and stop being used. So, um, you know, the thing for me is that racially charged language um, is a big barrier to inclusion. So that kind of is uh, the basis of where this story starts. And, you know, so basically the problem is, uh, you know, racially charged language. And so the first thing is, is that some people don't really know what it is. I think a lot of it is very pervasive. A lot of it has been kind of forgotten. Um, you know, I started thinking about the racially charged language that I use, the racially charged language I was aware of, um, and was really surprised to find out that quite a quite a bit of it was uh, was there that I didn't realize. Um, I think you know, starting off with uh, with easier ones, you know, cotton picking. I think that's a uh, very obvious one when you think about it. That it's a slur on on blacks and going back to slavery days. Uh, but then they start getting a little harder. Like Jip is a is a reference to the fact that uh, you know gypsies were were portrayed as people who would rip you off. Um, some other ones that I didn't know about um, peanut gallery. Uh, we actually use that a lot on the uh, at the board level, and I plan on bringing it up the next time. That you know the the peanut gallery is referring to the cheap parts of the theaters where the people ate peanuts, and so it's it's a slur on poor people. Uh, additionally, paddy wagon is a, a slur on Irish people. Um, other ones that I found uh, quite interesting were uh, things like eeny, meeny, miny, mo and uh, rude yard clip kipling. Um, not very good uh, things. You know, we used to use that to to pick who was it playing tag, but the real version of that rhyme is is not very appropriate, shall I say? Um, other words like cretins uh, was actually short for Christians. Uh, one that I didn't know, grandfather clause. I mean, you think about it all the time, you know, things are grandfathered in, uh, was actually done as a way of uh, uh, grandfathering in certain situations and whatnot, especially to hold blacks back in the south of the United States. Uh, nothing there was was very good. Uh, phrases like no can do was uh, making fun of uh, Chinese immigrants and things like that. And then finally, phrases like uppity uh, was referring to uh, certain people who were acting above their class, especially, uh, you know, slaves and things like that as well. So, um, you know, I was I was pretty surprised to find out how pervasive it was, how many things were forgotten. Um, you know, I started talking to people, looking at uh, things like housing, uh, what's called a plat, which is sort of the thing for a house. And you know, just found houses that have plats that say, for example, that they can't be sold to, quote, Negroes. And uh, that was done as part of a process called redlining, uh, very pervasive. And in fact, that hasn't been taken off the plats. Um, it was only made illegal in the United States with uh, some of the civil rights laws in the 1960s. Uh, so it's still on there, but, you know, it's not enforceable. Um, and this kind of stuff, uh, you know, really made me upset as I started to think about it and it really started to... Uh, you know, something that over the past 10 years I've been working on. So that ties into the Apache Spam Assassin Project, which is a project I've been working on for a long time since its nascent days. And uh, Apache Spam Assassin is a, is a scoring framework, an API and a program that helps classify spam. Uh, but it uses some terms that I think we've grown used to using, things like whitelist and blacklist, um, you know, to, to for good email and bad email. Uh, but also in programming, uh, especially with revision control systems, you get terminology like master and slave. And, you know, when you step back and think about this, this you know, it may not be racist language, but it's definitely racially charged language. And, uh, you know, we started about 10 years ago making it change. Um, 
basically what we call remastering the language. And, uh, you know, we started using terms like block list instead of blacklist as early as 2011. But uh, earlier this year, uh, we actually read an article uh, about the UK with your National Cybersecurity Center. Um, it was going to stop using terms like whitelist and blacklist. And we started a discussion that said, you know, hey, let's let's escalate getting this done. We're working on a big release for 4.0 uh, of our version of the software. And, uh, you know, we've been looking at it and it has not been easy. Um, I, you know, I say we've been evolving the language with style because originally we we started looking at different ter terminologies. Uh, we decided on block list and welcome list because that doesn't change the acronyms for whitelist and blacklist. Uh, which is used in a lot of things like uh, real-time block lists and um, DNSBLs and other things that uh, rely on this terminology. So, you know, there is an art to doing this and doing it well. Um, I would not say by any means that I've uh, mastered it, as you'll hear when we go through the rest of the story. Uh, but, uh, you know, it is something we've been trying to do and something we've been trying to embrace. And, you know, this article gave us a lot of... Um, impetus to do it. And then, you know, in the United States, there's been a lot of racial unrest and that has spread around the world. Um, and that has encouraged it as well. But, um, you know, unfortunately, as I alluded, you know, Merriam-Webster 2018 added dumpster fire to the dictionary, which I think was very appropriate for, uh, you know, the process over the last year of trying to remove the, or the racially charged language out of the spam assassin project uh, is aptly defined as a uh, a dumpster fire. Uh, in particular, you can see that as we started to announce this, um, and it was, uh, you can see the explosion of um, of uh, the posts on our users' mailing lists. I believe if you go in and look, that those two hundred and forty one posts in that July period were posted by posted by about nine people. So uh, a very vocal uh, minority, uh, very upset about it. And this continues to the day. In fact, there was even uh, several this morning and last night that just, uh, you know, continue to just be upset about it. That, uh, you, know, you know, just about every argument you can think of, uh, you know, that we're kowtowing to whatever, uh, that we're just, uh, you know, uh, whitewashing the uh, situation uh, to, to be a very bad pun, et cetera. And uh, it hasn't been very pleasant. Um, so, uh, sorry, Q&A is wrong. Uh, so the uh, CAM's conclusions uh, really, you know, here's some of the, the, the things that we've learned as we went through this process. So the first thing is a really uh, kind of an older thing. This long predates uh, the internet. It, uh, not necessarily the internet, the internet as most people know it. It predates, um, you know, uh, message boards on the internet and stuff like that. It, it goes back to the old, old bulletin board systems with dial-up modems and things like that. A guy named Tim Freeman wrote a wonderful post that I've embraced for a long time, which was do not feed the energy creature. And basically just that there's people out there that will uh, post things and just to try and rile up, uh, rile people up, no other reason. In fact, I, I know a person who in their younger days was a, was a very uh, uh, big energy creature. And to give you an example of this, he would go on to things like Christian bulletin boards and post a thing such as like, there is no God. And then he would log off never to log in again, knowing that that would uh, cause, you know, thousands and thousands of people to, to respond uh, to those postings. So uh, unfortunately, the only way to really combat it is to not to feed them. So from a more modern standpoint, uh, especially following up on the, the talk about autism, you know, I would say the applied behavioral analysis of this is that you don't reward a behavior you don't want to be uh, repeated. And uh, a lot of times that's all you could do. You know, these people post very uh, vile accusations, you know, baseless, et cetera. And, you know, all they want is to you to feed them with that energy. So you have to consciously just ignore them or only comment on the parts of it that are technically uh, valid. So um, that is a big point. Uh, another one of the arguments, you know, as I mentioned, people were saying that, oh, we were doing it for political reasons. As I mentioned, we've been doing it for over 10 years um, or that we were doing it because of X, Y, Z. And, you know, none of it was true. We started the vote in private, as is normal, uh, you know, from the UK. So it wasn't even a U.S. political issue that did it. But, you know, we've been doing it for quite a while. And we said, let's let's make this happen for 4.0. We had a vote. It was unanimous. And, uh, you know, then unfortunately, everything just exploded. Um, 
one of the biggest arguments and, you know, my inner engineering child kind of thinks about this is, you know, you don't break what isn't broken. Um, you know, the software is working fine. So, uh, you know, why break it? And the problem is, is that I think it is broken. I, I think using racially uh, charged terms in software is a broken point and it does merit the time and energy to get in there and fix it. You know, uh, if I ever buy a house or anything like that, that has a plat, I will probably insist that that plat is fixed if it has racially charged language in it, um, you know, before the, the house closes. Uh, I don't even know how you do that, but that would be what I do because that's probably the only opportunity to actually get it fixed. Um, but these things are broken. They need to be recognized. They need to be uh, taken out of our lexicon. Uh, they need to be taken out of our software. And uh, doing so makes us more inclusive and just helps people later on. You know, if you saw Alice's talk, you know, uh, she felt very marginalized uh, by what seemed to be very innocent statements. And I've heard this type of stuff. And so if fixing this fixes it even for a very small, uh, you know, minority of people, I still think it's very worth fixing, especially for the long term. The second thing that I really just kind of resonate with is just the, uh, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. quote, you know, it's never the wrong time to do the right thing. You know, this is the right thing to do. Yes, it's a pain in the butt. Yes, it changes a lot of things. Yes, it requires a lot of documentation changes. It requires conveying the change to the users. It required a lot of um, experimentation on our part, trying to figure out how we would make this work um, and have uh, backwards compatibility and forwards compatibility. Um, in fact, um, you know, I caught a lot of flack and it was a little bit earned on this one. You know, I named the plugin for the backwards compatibility racially charged uh, is the name of the plugin. So uh, you have to enable racially charged to turn on the old language in the code. Um, I originally considered naming it uh, something like I am a racist as a uh, uh, an homage to the I am lame in some of the video games like uh, that were driven by, I think, the Hexen engine. He had to type an I am lame to cheat. Um, so things like that. Uh, I consider doing the same thing. But, um, you know, it, it is the right thing to do. And, um, you know, the naysayers are, are you know, if, if, if they were even volunteers or committers on the project, I, I think I'd care more. But, uh, you know, I don't. So, you know, I will proceed along with what I think is right. And I'll vote with what I think is the right way to go. And, uh, proceed along. And that's, uh, you know, pretty much the only thing you can do. Uh, but, you know, as I mentioned, it was, there was a lot of problems. I mean, if you saw the amount of uh, posts, that was just one of the mailing lists. It was, you know, that kind of like 10 and 20 and 30 times more volume across all our mailing lists. Uh, so tons and tons of time uh, sucked up in that. Additionally, you know, people were talking about don't break what is it broken. Um, as we were trying to experiment things, we broke what we call the break fix cycle. So our development code um, basically became treated as if it was production level code. We weren't allowed to break it. People would, would complain with any little tiny issue that occurred. And um, uh, that ended up taking a lot more resource. In fact, we're still not done with the process. Uh, that I thought would take a, a week or two because we would just go in, start breaking things, figure out what was left and then go do it. But instead we've had to do uh, just significantly more testing, uh, more checking of the code, having more people look at it before it's committed to our re uh, revision control system uh, to make sure that any, everything isn't broken. Uh, we wanted to make sure the naysayers didn't have any reason to say, you know, ha ha, I told you so, this broke that. Um, if you are interested in supporting that effort, we do have a charity that's collecting, which is, you know, the the one that I helped found, which is McGraw Foundation, so McGraw.com. Uh, you don't have to. Even sometimes I will tell you that when people were writing those 240 plus uh, chains on that dev list and stuff like that, we did get quite a few people that wrote us off lists that just said, hey, you know, ignore those people, keep doing it. So uh, support, even if it's a, yes, this is a good idea. Uh, is, is appreciated because even if you go le read the list today, uh, you'll see it's just it's very vitriolic. It's it's not justified, especially uh, with everybody working um, as volunteers. You know, uh, the Apache Software Foundation doesn't pay anybody for code. Uh, it's a volunteer organization that just makes free software for the world uh, to make the world a better place. And uh, you know, people take advantage of that. So uh, that was one of the big big problems we had. Um, some resources, uh, you know, it's, I found uh, quite a bit of these quite interesting. Um, Guardian Digital, first of all, wrote a, a great article just about the problem. I think it covered pretty things pretty well. 
uh, about just the steps we took. Um, there's a lot of open source projects that are doing this now. Several at the Apache Software Foundation have been uh, doing the same thing. Uh, 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 GitHub and Twitter and uh, Google um, and probably many, many other companies that I'm not thinking of have also committed to doing things like removing uh, master and slave from their revision control systems, things like that, uh, because clearly that harkens back to slavery. But we don't need that. Um, and it needs to be changed. I think it just, unfortunately, has just gotten ignored for too long. It just wasn't thought about. Uh, additionally, uh, you know, just in case you think it's only a, a U.S. problem, you know, I did put one in here about removing harmful language from the U.K. Um, also, if you were caught by surprise about the one about the grandfather clause, like I was, the, the National Public Radio in the United States did a great uh, uh, issue about seven years ago about the history behind the grandfather clause. And, you know, there were other things in there, like, for example, in the United States, it's uh, time for the presidential voting. And we were going to the, the, the polls and I pulled out my uh, voting papers and handed them to the, the clerk. And my daughter was like, you know, what are those? And I was like, oh, that's a voter registration paperwork. And she said, why is it like paper? And I said, yeah, because they used to print them on paper so that people who were poor, who accidentally got them wet and they, you know, crumbled apart, weren't allowed to vote. And, uh, you know, she was just angry the whole rest of the day about that. Um, but it's stuff like that that you've, you just find is very pervasive and it's around and, and it needs to get fixed. Um, and then additionally, I wanted to, ch to thank Newstack. Um, I thought that article was particularly good, uh, really opened my eyes on some of the, the language that I hadn't thought about uh, that was exclusionary. And, uh, you know, some of the words that I put in here came from there, though a lot of them came from talking to people and just saying like, hey, you know, uh, what terminology are you aware of that you use that is, uh, um, that is uh, you know, racially charged, but uh, you really aren't aware of. And uh, that was extremely eye opening. So with that, um, that's pretty much most of my talk. I'm hoping there's a little bit of conversation and some chats. Um, uh, I probably talked too fast just to you know, for today. But, um, you know, I encourage you all to think about what racially charged language is in your technology, in your lexicon, and what you can do to remove it, uh, and at least identify it and come up with plans to remove it. So. That was a great talk, Kevin. Thank um, you. I have a question there. Uh, so you mentioned about mygrill.com. Um, in, in what ways can people contribute to, uh, to the website, uh, to the organization? Is it can can people volunteer to code or a monetary help? How how can people contribute? Uh, every way. So you know, if they uh, want to volunteer to code, we'll we'll help them code. If they want to volunteer dollars or bitcoins, we can handle things like that. If they just want to, you know, tell us, uh, you know, hey, love what you're doing. That's great. Uh, if they just want to spread the word or, uh, you know, whatnot, that's also cool. Um, the the foundation exists a lot to bring projects that aren't licensable under the ASL v2. So if they have a project they're interested in being underneath a, a foundation, uh, that's also something we can do. Uh, we recently took the uh, guardianship over for Mime Defang, which is a fabulous project uh, donated by Zix and App River. Uh, so things like that help as well, too. So sometimes it can be a place to donate uh, solutions and open source software as well. I see. That's a very great concept. Like I would be interested. I'll be in touch with you later. After this. Cool. I look forward to it. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, so that's all for today. It was oh, nice cool. to see you, Kevin. Great talk. Thank you. Very you nice to meet everybody. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Okay, um, we'll, we'll break uh, off for a bit um, for coffee and come back recharged um, for a workshop. So the link is over here. It, it would be a Google Meet um, link. So you could all join, um, join there at 4.45. Thank you all. See you in the after party, hopefully. <laughs>